Welcome one and all to the show. Just wanted to see if everything's gonna catch up. So funny how the screen has to take its time before actually, there we go, I think we're in, sweet. Welcome all of you, great to have you all here. I just moved away from this, uh, you see I'm looking at my laptop to follow the chat and all of a sudden it's just gone ballistic, so that's fantastic. Great to have you all here, thank you so much for joining. Always superb, okay, so what we're gonna do is first, how are we gonna structure this? I wanna say hi to you first, I think that's easy enough. Uh, ben, Dom, Megan, great to have you here. Hans, 121 click bezel, Reed, uh, Maynard, Ant, Gary, geez, there's so many of you. Maynard, just as I started the show, so suddenly all the chats just went ballistic. Fantastic to have you here. Can you hear me okay? I think that's a good way to start, as always. Comment one, that's always been our, our call sign. And we can get right into the show because it's going to be it's going to be a good one. We're going to get really philosophical and talk about the inner workings of the watch mind a bit. <laughs> Raymond asking, how am I doing? I'm fantastic, Raymond. It was a great day in the UK outside, so I got to enjoy some sun. You can hear me, that's fantastic. I hope you're all doing well and you're all great yourselves. Okay, so let's begin. We're going to be talking about choosing your next watch, what to look for, and the, the whole idea behind the subject, it came up last week during our Wrist Shot Week show. Someone asked me a question about saving up for a watch. And the thinking was, during the week, I was like, okay, let's sit down and maybe come across with a discussion, some kind of talk as a video. And then I thought, no, what are we better is actually having community engagement on the subject as well, because we all approach a subject like this differently. How best could we tackle this particular topic? We all have our own thoughts. So the thinking is uh, me pitching ideas to you. I've got a small write-up that I did. And then you can maybe highlight suggestions of watches that you've been thinking about. And we can just talk about the un using some underlying details that I've highlighted. Maybe it would help clear your mind and improve your thinking when it comes to picking up a watch. Uh, what's hilarious is that exactly a year ago, June 2019, just when I was starting out on the channel, I made a video all about choosing your next watch. It's got like 20,000 views. It's unbelievable but it was like four tiers. I actually just watched it now to try and like refresh my memory. It was very good, it was a, it was a write up, but of course the presentation could uh, do, some, do some work. And uh, it's just so funny going back and seeing just how everything was structured. Uh, so what I'll do for you who are watching in the future, I'll link it in the corner of the screen if you're interested. It's a bit of a different approach to what this one's gonna be like, but uh, yeah, let's get into it. Thomas, great to have you. Alex, there's a few more of you, Tippy, Jeb, Oh, it's so cool. It's so nice when there's actually an audience. And at the same time, I think to myself, it would be so nice to just present by myself sometimes so I don't have to like jump between. Uh, so Sazabolic says, hello there. Does branding or reliability matter? Branding or reliability? I think reliability is much more important than branding uh, when we talk about things at the end of the day. Okay, so, and if you'd like to get my attention easier, uh, tag me in the chat at IDGuy and I'll be able to catch up and, and read your question a lot quicker. Right, so we're gonna start with a live five. Live five is basically a selection of pieces that came to mind over the course of this week that I've been thinking about and thought it'd be nice to share with all of you. So it's a good way to get my, my design head in the, in the role, talking about details of the watches themselves. So if you're in the chat at this point in time, I'm going to drop in all the watches details, descriptions, so it might make uh, browsing from left to right a bit easier. We have a Datejust, Grand Seiko, uh, Amiga Planet Ocean, uh, Longines Heritage, and a Glasuta Rigonol Senator Excellence. So let's just talk about these briefly and then get into the subject at hand. The first 20 minutes of the show is usually when we get like philosophical and we start talking about the, the real uh, crux of the matter and then it, it divulges into whatever. So that's, that's always a joy. BS, good having you, Pilot Style, Buganish, Chili Badger, Kermit the Frog, Awesome, so, some new people joining. It's so good having you all here. Uh, as you might be aware, it's not wrist shot week. This is when we at least try to have a bit more of an open-ended discussion where we can, <laughs> what is the meaning of life? <laughs> you know, that's it. And it's something, it's one thing I say about science is that, you know, science is all about studying you know, the, the why of things, but it will never, I don't think it'll ever be able to really come up with a, a clarified answer about what the meaning of life is. So yeah, we can get deep into the whole, uh, watch collecting space and 
you know, of course, we all have our different approaches to this subject because some of us aren't interested in picking up new watches. This can be for the experienced buyer. This can be for the new time. You know, um, 121 click bezel says, just bought an Omega. Now know exactly what master chronometer means. Five second off from atomic time in three days. Yeah, it's ridiculous, right? If it's a meta certified, I, it blew my mind. Mine still runs either plus two or minus two. And I've been wearing it now constantly for like three months, four months, unreal. Uh, Hamilton broke, so I decided to sell it. Okay, so let me just get to these pieces first and then we can get to the questions and, and just the, the general talk. So talking about the date just first, this reference, let me just pull up my uh, crib sheet here. Um, Curtis, it's great having you here. Greetings from San Diego, it must be nice. Uh, so this date just, it's, it's what I believe is the reference 126333, and that means it's a 41 mil. It's very hard to tell whether it's 41 or 36 in a render, but you get the idea. The two-tone date just, jate just is a, is a gem. And speaking of which, uh, there was a question asked of me a while ago about talking about the, the date just, whether, it, whether or not it's obsolete at this point in time decided to make a video about that. So that's coming up next week. Um, obsolete or becoming obsolete in the in the scheme of watches in general, what where the demand is nowadays, if you know what I mean. Next up, we have this Grand Seiko. Now this watch, I need to do a write-up on it because it is beautiful. It epitomizes the Grand Seiko name to the core. The reference is SBGV245J. Nice mouthful, but it's a quartz. It's a 9F quartz movement. And just everything about it screams that blend of elegance and sports. You look at the case and the thickness of the lugs, the way the, the edges just chamfer so nicely. I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous thing, really has a nice presence. And uh, there's a couple of reviews on this of this watch that are on, on YouTube that I recommend you have a look at because it really is something special. I think these two pieces are quite emblematic of their respective brands, you know? Okay, and then in the middle, there was another question asked of me. I don't know who suggested it, but it was comparing the uh, the most hardcore divers, prototype divers around, one being the, uh, the Rolex Challenger Deep or the Deep Sea Challenger, and the other being the Omega Ultra Deep Professional Planet Ocean. It's a, it's a mouthful, but uh, this is the, the model. And the story behind it is great. I just finished the recording and now I'm editing it together for next week as well. And... Uh, it's a, it's a crazy piece, grade five titanium, nice use of colors. One really interesting aspect is the way they've actually integrated the uh, the case with the lugs. The lugs are, these little spring bars are like prongs that stick out of the sides of the case. It's all molded together. Now granted the, uh, the Rolex Deep Sea Challenge happened in what, 2012. This, this watch was made to dive five different deeps or trenches. Uh, in 2019. So it had a lot of technology behind it, but uh, the development is it's awesome. So that'll be coming up next week. And then these two, I thought these would be nice to compare against each other. Some have been mentioning they like this Glasuta um, Senator Excellence. It's a beautiful looking watch. Those numerals just sing. Okay, I want to get back into the chat and say hi to some of you. Someone's congratulating Ed. Did Ed pick up a new watch? And we need to mention what it is. Uh, New Black Bear 58, oh, congratulations. Glad that, you, glad that you picked it up. It's actually ridiculous how the demand for them have gone up so high. You can't actually find them in showrooms. Uh, just asking around, they just turn you away, you know? Congratulations. And uh, Zane saying Rolex. Well, we can talk about Rolex, of course, and other brands. We're just gonna, it's gonna be a more open-ended subject. Uh, and Megan saying, my very first Rolex, the date just, my, my 17th birthday. Wow, that's incredible. Okay. So we're going to chat about these two now. So left-hand side, we have the Longines Heritage Military, which is based on the RAF issued 6B pilot's watch. And such an incredible history. I'm actually working on a write-up on this now for the, uh, the Smiths variant. And again, you can see how the watches influenced me during the week because uh, you know I'm working on them. So it kind of kind of all blends in. But Everything about this watch I find just amazing. Eddie from Time Factors has been sending me articles and actual documents <laughs> saved from the uh, Ministry of Defense that have been scanned in, specifying all the regulations and anti-magnetic anti properties and the scales and the sizes, all the, the parameters they needed to fulfill back in the day. So in the write-up, I'll be sharing some of those details. But it's the aesthetics, you know. I don't know so much about the speckling. I think I did a video talking about watch patina a while back. The speckling is a bit peculiar. 
But these watches nowadays, these original 6B models are very difficult to find in the Longines variant. The Omega options, which are very similar to these, are pretty easy to find in comparison, but the Longines variants are sought after. And then the, the Senator, I just thought, let's have a look at La Suta and just pull out a watch that speaks. And these two together, I think, share a similar language. You know, this is more 40s inspired. This is a little bit more like late 30s as a transition. Uh, gorgeous numerals, just typically German, the way the numerals have been arranged and uh, the sword hands has a bit of a, a Flieger aesthetic behind it. Um, it's also a fully loomed, which is fantastic. So there's the Live 5, and it always works like a charm because I can just get into the subject and talk about watches within, you know, 10 minutes. It's great. Okay, I'm going to close this off and get to what I'm wearing. But first, let me just promote this one more time. Shameless plug. Uh, did a review and write-up of the new Smith's Mark 11 that came out, well, that hasn't been released yet. Uh, the prototypes were in my hands. And it's probably one of the best reviews I've done on this channel, you know, write-ups and recordings and video and everything else. So for those of you who are catching up with the show, I will link in the corner of the screen now to this video. Recommend you watch it because there's a bit of history, but then it's also, you know, some good video. And, uh, you know, I tried, tried my best to make the best out of what I could in a week. Uh, what I'm wearing, as per usual, is Smith's. Let me get a better shot. Smith's Everest. I threw it on a Jubilee bracelet, which is just works so well in this weather. It's fantastic. So let me just pull this up for a sec as I get to you in the chat. <laughs> it's funny. You have to keep to a schedule, but at the same time, okay, let me just get this mouse out of the way. How am I going to do that? I don't know. Just leave it there. Okay. Get to you in the chat for a sec. There's lots of new people. Carlos, welcome. Juan, Brummy, uh, Hans, Christian. There's so many more. I, if, I, if I miss you in the chat, it's not because I'm uh, I'm avoiding you. It's just <laughs> the chat goes pretty quickly. <laughs> Reed saying that the review was fabulous. It was so much fun to put together. I really expected it to take a lot more time to get you know all the parts, but it really did just flow. It worked pretty well. Hans, it's uh, thank you so much for that. Okay, so... And, and Raymond saying the Glasuta original superior to the Longines. Well, of course it is. If you're talking about movement quality and the work that goes into, I mean, you can't compare the two brands for sure. Um, and he's talking about the vintage stuff. I guess we could look at it a different way. The Cedar Canoe joining from Sweden. Dimitris from Greece. Orange Hand. Awesome to have you all here. BDev. Okay, so the bonus about this, having having people on the chat, is actually the engagement between all of you because people who are going to be re-watching the show, I think it's important that we can share our thoughts together. <laughs> that way, it's an extra resource. Because I think YouTube as a platform, as much as it is a place where people want to advertise and sell their watches to, to everyone, I think it's also such a good place as a resource for us to learn and, and study and get more bit of you know, insight, personal insight which is why I think Wrist Shot Week works so well. You know, it works in tandem with a subject like this because we get to see what other people are wearing and so we can judge uh, what appeals to us the most, you know? So I'm going to leave this little Everest in the corner while I get into the actual subject. You won't believe, but I actually did a small, very, very basic write-up rundown of the subject. And, you know, as the show goes in the beginning, we just, we just get a bit more internal chat about stuff in depth. Okay, 73 Math is joining. Great to have you. Uh, Jacob, Soman, there are so many of you here. It's fantastic. There's already 100 of you. I think that's such a great cap. Just 100 people, it's fine. You know, under the radar, low key. Um, and Megan saying, such great vlogs. Watch every single week. Thank you, Megan. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And I really enjoy doing it. I hope you enjoy, you know, the, the thought that goes into some of these subjects and topics. Anyway. Let's get in to this subject now. How are we going to approach it? I wrote a few basic one-liners. What did I say? When it comes to choosing a watch, I wish that Smith's New Wish did not have a Miota. Raymond, that, that's the one aspect that doesn't appeal to me about this watch. It has a 9015. All the other watches I've had are all ETAs. And uh, yeah, it's a pity. It is a pity. I agree with you there. So talking about you as an individual, this is the important thing when it comes to choosing a watch. And... Uh, are we going to do one question? Sorry, I'm, I'm breaking away breaking away from the subject and getting into the chat. Reed saying, are we going to do one question at a time? No, no, this is just kind of like a, a general overline, very basic run through of the subject itself. 
Um, is it noisy, Hans? Yes, it's pretty noisy. I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, I'll try and get it to move in the microphone. No, you probably won't be able to hear it, but anyway. So as an individual, I think this is, what I found so peculiar about the platform is that generally we're always marketed to about what is popular, what we should collect, what's important. And there's never really the justification as to why it is so. That'll be the last point of this, this subject. But I think as a person, as someone who enjoys the watches that you do, what is it do you, do you really look for in a watch? Um, and, and adding to that, what is your lifestyle like? As in, what do you do on a daily basis? Do you hike? Do you, you know, sail on ships? Do you work in a boardroom? All of these little things play into that role. Um, situations when you wear the watch, I guess that, that adds to it as well. And uh, what kind of watch person are you? And I think when we get into, as an individual, it's pretty basic. It doesn't really need, need much of an answer. But when we get into the uh, actual characteristics and details of a watch, I think this is something that, of course, divides opinion. And this is what makes the subject pretty interesting, is that there's a lot of midway between these subjects, too. When we talk about characteristics, whether it's sports or dress, um, this is how I you know, categorized watches in the first place, saying that there, there are only really two categories. There's sports and there's dress. But there isn't really. At, the, at this point in time, we find watches that are sharing both qualities pretty well. But really, on the whole, when we talk about the, the general characteristics, a sports watch or a dress watch, do you prefer batons or numerals or both? A modern piece or a vintage piece or a reissue? I think the reissue aspect kind of rides the line of both areas too, you know? And then details. Uh, there's mention by, by uh, Hans saying aesthetics and movement. One aspect I didn't add was movement. Don't know why this was uh, this was such a quick little thing, but I guess we can talk about complications and add that into the mix. So when it comes to details, size, do you prefer something that's oversized or average or undersized? Uh, color, do you want something that's monotone or colorful? And you'll understand the real detail as we get to the very end of this, because I will highlight the final point, the real designer's point of this, this argument. Uh, complications, do you prefer something none or many. Do you want a simple watch that has no date? You want something that is an annual calendar, perpetual calendar, so on, so forth. And then purpose, as in, do you want it to have a bezel, chronograph, other complications like that? All of these factors, I mean, it's, it's a very deep subject when you think about all of these things together, when it's broken down to you, uh, when it comes to really honing in on what watch speaks to you the most. And then when we get to the, the real, like, design aspect of the subject, which I think is so important that's never emphasized enough. The real question of asking why. Let me try and come on, work with me here. No, that's not doing it. I'm trying to shrinking this down. Let's see. Hold on a sec. The real question is asking why for all of these points. A lot of the times you can say, yes, I enjoy a watch that's simple. Yes, I enjoy a watch that has no complication or something that's small or something that has a bracelet or leather strap, but why? What's the reason? Why does it work for you? You know, why are you, why are you actually interested in it at the end of the day? Just because you're told that you're supposed to be interested in it, that it's a hype watch, that it's popular. Uh, will it work in your collection is the last real aspect. But I think the, the whole subject of asking why, querying, all of these points with regards to their characteristics, their details, their you know, styles is the ultimate thing that is just never mentioned at all on this platform. I mean, it's, it's always, we marketed too about the price, about the movement. I mean, that's all well and good, but you know, digging a bit deeper, I think to create that real long lasting relationship is asking yourself, just why do these things work to you so well? And uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Thomas Burnett's talking about the weather today. Okay, so I have I've, th that's basically my my shtick on this whole uh, this whole theme and the subject. But now we can try and use some of these elements and run through a series of watches. I think I I did pull up a uh, a Black Bay of some kind. I think I pulled up a GMT or something. We can look at for a second. Uh, there we go. That helps. So the Black Bay GMT, for example, it was mentioned about a fifty eight by uh, by Ed, and it's that whole thing of as to why it's it's become such a popular watch and why do people like it so much? Now it's not that's that's of course what the general population wants us to think about. But you as a person, what exactly about it speaks to you? 
And, you know, again, it's so nuanced and there's so many added details that go into the subject itself, which is why I think the community engagement is good. And you can all share your thoughts and opinions on the subject. And so it goes. The momentum carries on from there. So I want to catch up. I see Dear Artifact has joined us. Uh, there's a few more of you. Again, there's, there's talk about versatility by Ant. Um, what else? Reliable movements. Let's see. What else? Seiko. Uh, and it's it's really personal preference. Is this live, Worm Germ? Yes, it is live. It's great to have you here. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see. Jacinta, welcome to the show. Great to have you here as well. And let's see. Reed is saying good evening. Oh, that's good. Okay. So let's think of a watch. Let me pull up something. Let's actually just look up the Senator Excellence, which is something that we spoke about a second ago. And really try and hone in on what makes this watch so interesting. And and the, the underlying detail with regards to asking why, my the thing that always brings me back to a watch is it needs to have something about it that sings to me. I think it's it's nice when you look at a watch. I mean, just for example, uh, I don't know. Okay, personal preference. I look at this watch and I see Pepsi GMT. Um, it's not something that really sings to me. And it's not something that continually pulls me back per se. Uh, but when I look at something like, I don't know, the Aquanaut, I find quite an interesting example because of X, Y, Z. You know, we're looking at the, the batons on the dial. We're looking at the minute track, the numeral placement, those little details, just looking at the Senator Excellence. I mean, at first you get, you get drawn in by the size of the dial and the numerals, but what else about it speaks to you? Then you notice it has a rail dial, which is very unique and different. It has five minute markers within the dial as well. So the real aspect underneath all that we've spoken about when it comes to the characteristics of choosing a watch, the real reason of asking why does it appeal to you so much, I think something I should have mentioned at the very end is it needs to be something that always continually pulls you back to it again and again. And I think the one watch, I pulled up a date just as an example, but the one watch that does this to me the most nowadays is the 1815 chronograph from Alunga and Zona. And the reason why, quite simply, is you know it, it looks fairly simple on first glance, but you then you, you start you start breaking up the details on the dial. You start seeing that the sub dials are actually not centered. You notice that is this a tachymeter? No, it's a pulsation. You notice the pulsation dial and how these uh, these numerals are spaced next to the pulsation number, the actual text, uh, the way the text is arranged at the top of the dial, the numerals themselves, just the sheer amount of details. But then you, you draw back and away out of the watch and you see it's actually pretty simple, relatively simple on, on first impressions. It's only when you start really focusing on the details do you start seeing, wow, yeah, this watch pulls me back for a different reason every time. And ultimately, I think that's what gets you into the watch and keeps the watch in your collection at the end of the day. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, just a quick, uh, you know, you pick it up and you say, great, this is the watch for me. It's, it's versatile, it ticks all the boxes that I wanted it to, but then it's, it's saying, you know, what really about it today compared to tomorrow or the day before, what is it about this piece that keeps me coming back for more, keeps me engaged and interested in it? So yeah, uh, as it is, that's, that's always my shtick and my spiel. I also pulled up an Ocean 2000 from IWC. This is just fascinating. In its simplicity, it's just beautiful. Uh, there was mention about Patek 5170. As always, the, the chats go so fast, I miss them. But uh, tag me in the chat and I'll be able to read it quick. Ben Space Vulture, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. I really hope you enjoy them. Uh, this, this to me is a time when I can just talk without any real preparation. Uh, and it makes, it makes my time a bit simpler. I don't have to sit for hours recording and writing and uh, Try it on. That's that's another thing. Sorry, Hans. It's something I should have mentioned in the beginning as well. Trying on the watch is very important too. It's that initial romance that I think we need to break through. The initial romance is great. You pick up the watch, you say, this is for me, it's fantastic. But I just hate hearing stories about people buying watches and then selling them within like, you know, a month or two. And it's it's kind of, it kicks you a little bit. You think to yourself, what was the thought process that went into picking up the watch? Was it really down to that initial love and then it just got a bit stale or the watch itself outlived its romance period? I don't know. Uh, it's all down to personal preference at the end of the day, of course. 
Uh, Juan's saying, I enjoy all, all types of watches down to Swatch, which I use at the gym. And that's another thing. I mean, we can pull up Swatches in a second and talk about them for sure. And uh, Buganish says, I want a watch that's versatile and that is both resilient during activity and elegant in more formal situations. That's perfectly said. And that's, that's really what many seem to want out of their watches, especially when you're paying a fortune for them nowadays. Uh, you want something that's versatile every day. That's, that's mainly why I picked up the, the Seamaster that I did, because it just blended in so well. Size also played a part in that too. I prefer my date just more than others from Morgan um, or MRG. Okay, I'm going to scroll down the chat because it's just getting too fast. Uh, Matthew, great to have you here. Dear Artifacts saying, as you state, the why is key. Your background is in design, so that will most likely be the driving force for you. For me, I'm chasing a feeling. Very good point. Your Artifact always drops such good lines here. I think, you know, it's, it's so peculiar because designers, <laughs> the whole idea about design is to be you know, artistic, but then also like trying to approach it a bit logically. And I need to pull up another watch. I think we're looking at these too much. Let's look at the Aquanaut for a sec. Uh, so, so generally, design is about you know attacking it artistically and looking at how can we make it look pretty. But next to artists, the designer wants to try and approach it a bit more logically. You know, have a logical approach about how they break down everything. And it's so it's drilled into you. I tell you, university. It's, it's funny because university is so different to the real world when you're dealing with clients, but university, it's always about questioning why. Why were these lugs done the way they were? Why is it polished here? Why is it brushed there? Of course, it's different when you're talking about watches. A lot of it's stylistic. It's not necessarily functional all the time, but you can extrapolate elements and put them in together. The Aquanaut has really spoken to me recently because of my, my love affair with these little Smiths, these little Smiths field pieces. And I feel like this watch really took its inspiration from field watches of the time. I mean, you notice just how, ooh, beautiful resolution. You notice just how the batons are arranged and the minute track is there with all the numerals set around. It reminds me so much of a W10 field watch. And I feel like this was something that played into the, the development phase. So dear artifact, that was a great point. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, Stanley's saying, is that a South African accent you hear? Yes, yes it is, it sure is. It's born in Cape Town. And uh, I now live in the UK. But very, very well uh, thought through. It's funny, there's normally debates about where the accent comes from, whether it's English, whether it's Australian, New Zealand. Yeah, it's South African. Uh, my parents are from Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. So there's a bit of, bit of twang in there as well. A bit of a mixed bag, you know. So Tippy's saying that the Dawn Blith 991 is a contender that I may get for a one watch collection. Well, we're going to pull it up right now. Let's get to it and start, get, get the ball rolling. And I think this will be a nice way for us to kind of break into the, the subject itself. Uh, you know, looking at what you're looking, looking at what you're looking at, I tell you, the coffee high of mine. Wow, this is gorgeous. So this is on Chrono 24. What a gorgeous piece. I mean, that, is, that looks so much like this Longines that we just looked at already. Uh, and it makes, it really does speak to styling of the 40s, that time period. Um, and let's, I'll, I'll keep it up here for a second while I address some of your comments in a sec. Um, watch people love to experience all watches, just can't have them all. And that's very well said, for sure. I'm going to jump back to the Aquanaut. I want to have a look at it a bit more. Um, I mean, that's, that's definitely the point. We want to experience, but then it's, it's really focusing in on what we want to own at the end of the day. And uh, dear artifact mentioning, when I wear my Black Bear 58, I feel like Sean Connery as Bond. When I wear my Speedmaster, I'm an Apollo astronaut. When I wear my Smiths, I'm Edmund Hillary. And it's that, that emotional, that's, that's very well put as well, talking about the emotional aspect that goes into it for sure. Uh, when I wear my, my Seamaster, I think Cold War. I think uh, double agent, you know, Cold War period. Got the faux radium on the dial. All these little things, of course, there's, there's definitely an emotional connect. There has to be an emotional connection. I mean, speaking about the logical side of things, it's great. But, you know, if you don't feel connected to the watch, you'll never, you'll never fully love it, you know. Um, let's see what Reed says. Reed says, my driving force now for a watch is a lug-to-lug -lug length. I have to find watches that fit well across my wrist. Excellently said. Um, I'm in the same field as you, for sure. It's, it's that idea of where do you want it? Do you want it mid-sized? Do you want it extra large? Do you want it uh, just so that it, it reaches the limits or do you want it to be just under the size so that the bracelet can have a bit more, have a bit more play and status on the wrist? Let's have a look at another piece. 
Funny, I tried on one of these. I watched, this looks exactly, does it have a, it has an olive strap and everything. I had tried on this exact watch, uh, maybe December, and it was the most peculiar experience. 36 mil <laughs> Patek Aquanaut. You put it on and you think you're wearing something like a swatch. I kid you not. Uh, it's, it's so light and <clears throat> light. Fisherman's friend time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to hit the coffee and then I'm going to pop one in. But uh, it was just the most bizarre feeling that you're wearing an Aquanaut. And mind you, this was at the same time when I was wearing a, uh, uh, what is it, a reference 5712 rose gold. So you've just worn this modern piece and then you jump back to a vintage model of 36 mils with a rubber strap and it just felt so, so different. Um, okay, I'm gonna get to the next point from Maynard saying, for me at this point, I actually want a watch that is not necessarily super versatile. I have six watches now and have the basics covered. I want something more unique and complicated now. Very good. And Bugen is saying worm germs got it. Let me see if I can read his comment somewhere up here. I don't know if I, if you can repeat it again, that'll be great, worm germ, whilst I'll be here all night. Uh, <laughs> Stanley's saying, always great to hear from a fellow South African. Yeah, apparently, uh, you know, I haven't heard about many South African watch related people before. So it's nice. I mean, I, I'm told that it's nice to have a South African accent on the platform. Um, Mayna also saying to me, everyday watches make for a boring collection. Nicely said. I want a well-rounded collection with several complications and more basic movements as well. And this definitely adds to that. The whole idea of do you want color? Do you want something more sparse? Something more, should we say, monotonous? Um, and, and different complications and aspects too, for sure. That's very well put. Um, Jacinta mentioned something I just missed. Um, great watch having in rose gold. Love wearing... Uh, Love wearing it, a modern Patek. Oh, they're gorgeous. I mean, I can pull up a 5170 just now. Um, to be saying, look at the case back of the watch too. Are we talking, oh, the, the Dornbuth. I'll look at that now. I'm just catching up with your chats. I get, I, get on a, I get on a roll and I miss a lot of things. I'm up for a 5670, sorry, a 16570 Polar. Can you or anyone suggest where prices are going this year? Les, very good point. Someone please answer him in the chat. And I want to scroll down to the bottom and catch up with all of you here. Again, if you'd like to get to me more easier, uh, tag me in the chat at ID Guy, and I'll be able to see it easier. You should go back to the dawn booth. I will definitely, for sure. And Worm Germ, I said that what Dear Artifact said is schizophrenia. <laughs> really? Uh, what, as in, as in he has like a bit of a, a double standard with regards to what he approaches? Jacinta, thank you so much. That is Ladies and gentlemen, this is the biggest super chat I've ever received before. That is incredible. Jacinta, thank you so, so much. This is absolutely amazing. Um, and you are, you're Megan's sister. It's both of the sisters on the show. It's fantastic. You're both running on different, uh, different machines. So it must be pretty funny listening to the show, you know, separately. Uh, it's just so great having you here. And thank you so much for the super chat. I'm actually going to be putting this money into a project that I'm working through at the moment. Um, I really want to design something that I can send out to the audience. I want to design uh, maybe a, a range of t-shirts or something. There was mentioned the t-shirts would be good or coffee mugs. There needs to be something cool that everyone can enjoy uh, that's linked to the, to the channel in some way. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to be designing some graphics and uh, maybe run them by you on what you like, what you don't like. Could see how that goes in the future. Thank you again so much, Jacinta. This is it's so nice of you. <laughs> Okay, so worm germ, multiple personalities. Okay, got it, got it. How about a watch stand? Reed, it's, I can definitely do that in future, for sure. I need to get into the actual manufacturing side. At first, I want to start small, something more graphically related, and then we can get to the physical products because, you know, as it is, making stuff in mass, you know, reaching manufacturers and all of those details. At this time, it's very difficult, as I'm sure most of you know. But, um, yeah, I definitely want to get a bit more open with, a product of some kind that's that's worthy of the platform and, and so on. Okay, I'm going to get back to this Dornbluth. I'm probably butchering the name completely. And there was mention about looking at the movement, I think, earlier. So just breaking down the watch and its aesthetics, we can start. Here we go. Wow, this is beautiful. Whew, that is stunning. I love, and it's, it's rose gold. What kind of finish is this at the back? The engraving on the oh, engraving on the balance. It is absolutely beautiful. So let's just look at the the general aesthetics briefly and just talk about the watch and what makes, oh my goodness. This is the thing, this happened last time during the show. When I, uh, I zoom in on various things, so the image decides to shrink in size. I hope this is okay, that you can sort of see what's going on on the screen as I 
try to present as, as well as possible. So talking about the, the aspects that bring you back to this watch, the numerals to me, what stand out to me the most. And then it's looking at the balance between the sub dials and the rail track that runs around the main dial, which is also fantastic. Uh, look at the price. I definitely don't want to do that. Is it, is it just ridiculous? I thought I saw 4,000, but I hope maybe I'm wrong. 4,000, that is unbelievable. $4,700 for this piece. And here you, <laughs> this fun, Tippy, thank you for that mention. Um, it's, it's like, you think to yourself, this watch is 10 grand plus, no problems. But 4,000 for a watch like this, very different. Truth Fears, great to have you here. Thanks for joining. So the, ele the elements that bring me bring me in, I, I love heat bluing on hands. I think it's such a fascinating thing. Uh, this is this photo is out of focus, but you get a good idea of just how it's finished in detail. Small aspects. Very good point, Tippy. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, as a one and only watch, oh, this is also gorgeous. If the hands were also heat blued on this, that would be fantastic. And for those of you who don't know, I, uh, I did a bit of looking into why watches' hands are heat blued, thinking that there was there was a real underlying reason. Apparently, it has to do with helping the hands resist corrosion ever so slightly. But then it's also just a sign of artisanal quality. It's, it's for a watchmaker to show off their style, to show off their approach. And it's quite a difficult procedure. It's heating it at the perfect time. And it's, you know, it's, it's a deep thing. Thank you for mentioning this, Tippy. What a gorgeous looking piece. And now I'm open to, open to suggestions. We've been running the show for uh, 35 minutes at this point. And now we can get to talking about watches that maybe you're looking at, that you're interested in, and how how exactly we could go about looking at the pieces from a bit more of an open-ended perspective. What about the thing speaks to you? And really, the most important thing at the end of the day is substantiating your answer with why it speaks to you so much, uh, which is not done enough, I don't think. And uh, it's amazing because I just I look at how channels advertise things for sale. I'm thinking of the main platforms that sell watches, that, that use the platform to sell watches. And Rich Buddy's saying, oh, nice to have you here, Rich. Thank you for joining. I'm considering a Patek 5320. Oh, let's have a look. Let's jump to some Pateks. Uh, this, to me, I think is just Nirvana. The, the 1815 all black is just beautiful. Okay, Patek reference 5320. I'm guessing this is a perpetual calendar, and it's, oh, okay, I have seen this before. Not the one I was thinking. Cream dial. And, and this is the thing. I mean, this piece actually reminds me of, I'm sure it was inspired by 40s era pieces for sure. Uh, gorgeous syringe hands and all of those details. I also really enjoy how the calendar is integrated into the dial. I hope I can get a, let's get a bigger image somehow. Again, apologies if I can't get the details up for you that easily. At the uh, Safari fights me half the time when I'm trying to get something on the page. One thing I really love about these Patek calendars, especially this, this is this, this a perpetual or an annual? I would imagine it's a perpetual because it has the quarters on the dial. Um, I really enjoy this aspect of how the dials are arranged right there under the, uh, above the logo. So it's very easy to see, but it's also out of the way for the most part. The polarizing aspects to this watch is the cream dial. Does the cream dial really speak to you? I must say the raised numerals really add a, a nice touch. Raised numerals plus the syringe hands combined so nicely together. It's that cream finish. Is that the aspect that really brings you in? Is it something that might cause a bit of divide? Don't know. It's great though. Thank you for this, Rich Buddy. And yeah, let's just keep rolling through with some of these pieces. Again, if you can uh, tag me in the chat, I'll be able to <laughs> I'll be able to catch up. And to be saying, should we go back to the crank watch? Oof, that is is not exactly a pretty piece. Uh, I thought it was funny the other day. Okay, Kyle. Ooh, JLC Reverso. Let's have a look at some of those. That'll be nice. Uh, just in general, uh, for those of you who are joining, who are new, the first 20 minutes or so of the show is normally the, the breakdown of the subject matter. And then afterwards, it kind of just uh, turns into anarchy and we just chat about anything and everything. Um, asking the question why. I think if you want to take anything away from this this discussion, it's honing in on the watch that you like, but then it's saying, why exactly do you like it? Is it the color? Does it, does it line up with the watches in your collection? Does it speak to you? I think this, this maroon is something special. And this, this lines up with what Mena mentioned, actually, because he was saying that he wants something that's not 
monotonous and, and boring per se. Uh, this with a gorgeous burgundy color just adds a completely new dynamic. It also screams reverso, which is something unique. You know, you're wearing this watch. It doesn't exactly, even if it was just a swatch, it looked this color, it would catch attention. Generally, reversos are not made to catch attention, but in this configuration, it does make quite a statement about itself, you know? Uh, okay. Uh, Stephen, thank you so, so much for the super chat. Thank you for the great streams and small donation for the future project, for sure. Thank you. It really is such a pleasure. Um, I love doing it, and I just, I love talking about watches. It's something that uh, gets me interested, gets me engaged. I don't know how I ever got into the subject and the hobby, but it's something that just keeps me, keeps me rolling. And there's just so much depth to these things that we just don't necessarily consider. Uh, the best thing is there are just infinite amounts of watches nowadays, which means that, you know, you're never really out of a subject. You can always find a subject somewhere, you know. Uh, Jenks mentioning a, a collection of square watches, maybe. Something I should have mentioned along with size is just what exactly the shape of the watch is that you're looking for. And, you know, do you want something like a, a when I think of square and rectangles, I think Cartier Tank, JLC Reverso, but there are so many in the line and that kind of lines up with vintage. Do you want something that is more thirties inspired that used that, that aesthetic back in the day? James Conn, Tribute to Deep Sea. That's a nice piece. Let's have a look at that. And again, tag me in the chat if you want to get my attention quicker and I hope I, uh, I catch you eventually. Yeah, it's it's a peculiar thing running the show. This this is very much like a presentation, uh, and not so much a um, a dialogue shared between people. But I try my best to like grab you and, and chat to you at the same time. So this is the deep sea alarm. I don't know if there, there was a few tribute to deep seas. They've done chronographs in the past before as well. I find this watch fascinating in many ways. Uh, I don't know if this is a tropic strap. It's on. No, it's not. But it is a fascinating piece. Let's see if there's another good shot of it somewhere. So what about this watch speaks to us? And we did have the, uh, the IWC Ocean 2000 up a second ago. has a similar approach. The way these dials are arranged, I think this is the um, European market with the deep sea alarm at the base. And the American market has nothing on it. You might need to correct me there. But this falls in line with the reissue pieces. And, you know... Are you interested in that field entirely? It's something that speaks to me. I don't know why, but but vintage reissue watches, the whole idea of that vintage-inspired aesthetic but modern components really does speak to me because they are watches that I can just wear and use every day without much thought. When you're dealing with something vintage and old school that maybe has you know the threading on the crown isn't that, that good or uh, the case itself is susceptible or you're dealing with um, a Bakelite bezel or anything like that, it kind of, in the back of your mind, you think to yourself, well, I need to treat this with a bit more care and, and respect. So there is, I think mean, this is a whole new genre. I did a video about reissue dive watches, failed to mention this watch in it because I didn't necessarily think of it as a dive watch with a rotating bezel. This is more of a memo box, you know, so it's gorgeous though. You can talk about it more in detail. Rich Buddy says, does it ring underwater? Yes, it does. It doesn't exactly ring. It actually buzzes. It makes like a, like a cricket noise. If you know what the, uh, the Vulcan cricket sounded like, it has this it's a peculiar sound. Um, but I don't think it chimes like a bell. It has more of a buzz to its, to its sound itself. Um, but there are versions of the Memovox, like the, uh, what's it called? The Master Compressor Memovox that does have a real chime to it. So dependent on the piece itself, and here is a, this is a vintage piece by the looks of things. Is this a reissue? No, this is also a reissue. Notice how this dial doesn't have any text on it. And I think this has to do with the American market. There was something about maybe Buy American Act back in the day where they didn't want, you know, registered details on the dial. I don't know. Vacheron. Oh, geez, this is good. There's a few good questions from Shijan asking about the Vacheron 30020. I'm not familiar with that in the slightest. Me and references. Some days I can be really good, other days not at all. Uh, I hope it's not a 222 or something. 30020. Let's have a look. Oh, wow. This is gorgeous. Gorgeous piece. Okay, so the first thing I've actually, this is something that just comes to mind immediately when I look at a watch like this. The only thing that really dates, oh, it's gorgeous. It's a, um, it's a miniature repeater as well. 
you notice on the side here. And I need to pull up some other pieces before I get lost in this watch itself. And mentioning the Overseas Ultra Thin. It's a gorgeous piece. Let's pull that up as well. Uh, that is a, this is a great example of a watch that you could pretty much wear for anything. And just by the way it presents itself, it does hit so many marks that, that many of us look for nowadays. Um, it's a great piece to end a collection off in many ways. Vacheron Tonograph, oh my goodness. Thank you, Julian, for that. And all of you who are joining, uh, who I haven't said hi to, great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, wish that more companies had clearer hands, easier to read from Sam. Nicely said. A lot of the time, they're highly polished. The one thing that makes watches easier to read, ironically, is the, uh, the, the, indis, the what am I saying? The Luminova on the hands is what makes them easier to read when they're in direct light, which is pretty funny. Um, so Raymond saying, Lakuta is for the American market, JLC for European. Thank you for that, Raymond. Okay, so let's, Dear Artifact saying, the key is to make sure that you what you like you like what you invest in, whether it's quirky or mainstream, it has to be for you. I mean, that's very good. And uh, Ben asking me to make a video with producer Michael, that'd be a lot of fun. I'd love to travel out to Los Angeles, actually. I've got a few friends in, in California that I'd love to meet up with, and there'd be a nice trip as well. But the thing is, my channel is not popular. No, it's small, so it's not like anyone's heard of me. <laughs> Charles Frodsham, it's another cool piece. Okay, just before it gets, before it gets gnarly, um, Angie's saying, check out the ultra thin. So this not being an ultra thin, there's probably a small detail with no date. Oh, it's cool. It is so cool. I didn't even know that this piece existed. Can I say that? Ultra thin without a date. This must be a new piece that's just come out recently. So when we talk about this watch, I need to find a good, good presentation picture so we get an understanding. Oh, this is beautiful. This is really one to cap off a collection. Um, so... Let me carry on through. Grand Hoyer Minute JD. Grand Hour, sorry. Okay, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. When we're looking at this piece in particular, this is obviously a very, very rare vintage model. I'm pretty sure there's only like, what, 10 of them in the world probably. Uh, it's been, probably I can see it's uh, SJX is talking about it. I'm sure it's been up for auction. So this piece is the full package. It has a full calendar, moon phase, but then also minute repeater. It's one of the most complicated movements you can get out, of, out there nowadays. And the one aspect, when it comes to breaking down the watch and choosing a watch and, and what about it speaks to you, when you go solely into a watch because of its complication, I think that's a mistake. The aesthetics are important, yes. And I mean, this definitely calls back to talking about Charles Frodsham, traditional English, French inspired watchmaking from back in the day. Um, but I think complication alone shouldn't be the thing that governs your choice. I mean, aesthetically, it's pretty beautiful how it's all balanced out. Um, but then you need to look at the entire package and, you know, the details like the lugs. That's the one aspect that divides me from this piece, that the teardrop styled lugs, mm, for my taste at least, it dates the watch. You know what I mean? And do you want a watch that really, I mean, in saying that, since this watch is positioned in the way it is, visually it looks the way it does to resemble watches of the past, the teardrop lugs are very relevant for a watch of this time, being inspired by that period. But it's that, that aspect that, that I say, mm, could that be improved? Would that be the thing that divides my opinion or not? It's really, you know, asking the question why, it's breaking down all of the elements that I think... Uh, really brings in your decision a bit more, makes it a bit clearer. Okay, and there was also mention about the overseas ultra thin. Oh, it's a beautiful looking thing. I've never seen this piece before. Might have, but it slipped my mind. I, uh, I don't even know the size of it. It looks like it's 38 mils. Um, no date complication. I mean, this is just gnarly. This next to what we've just looked at it actually works out quite well. Talking about the, uh, the perpetual that we've just looked at a second ago. Well, I'd say this is an annual. I don't think it's a perpetual. Maybe it is. Um, this dial arrangement is virtually the same, except it's now cased in a more modern watch. The question is, does it work as well here as it does here? I think this dial arrangement for this style of case works much better than a modern watch with uh, a modern styled case with, with a vintage inspired dial. So it's it's a peculiar thing. It's this, this subject is so deep and involved and it envelops you, which is why I wanted it to be spread over the course of like two and a half hours instead of being something that, you know, takes a few minutes to talk about. 
there's lots of depth and there's so many more suggestions now about zeniths and uh k kyle saying my grail vacheron is a 1921 Ooh, yeah we're just looking at vacherons it's great uh so again i was i was told that this with just jlc that's for european and the kutra is for the american market i think i got that right i don't know um so vacheron 1921 we've spoken about it a lot i think it was featured in last week's wrist shot show and I mean, it's to die for. It's just so bizarre and quirky and peculiar. What what really speaks to most of us, I think, is just the quirkiness factor. The idea that it's offset, that is not perfectly balanced. And we won't have to talk just about high horology. We can also talk about the, the simpler stuff, uh, the more affordable pieces too. I think that's important. Um, Zenith Defy, I need to get up. Uh, let's have a look. There was mention about a Zenith Defy a second ago. Uh, let's see. 21 ultraviolet go 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 jenks okay let's have a look the zenith defy is a line that really uh, i've said this too many times that it has jean claude's dna all over it and i don't know if that's such a good thing what did you say it was a 21 yeah i mean it's there was talk about hublot a while back and this just reminds me of hublot is this a newly released piece have they brought out a new defy in the line come on give me a good shot here there we go are we going to load? No, we're not going to load. Hmm. Let's see. Where's a better shot? <laughs> this is another problem. So this is a bracelet integrated model. <laughs> I guess you you wanted me to chat about this because you know I can have a field day. The panda dial. Oh, geez. Okay, we can have a look at that now in a second. So the Vacheron 1921. I think it's one of the most peculiar and interesting watches in this this family of pieces. It's definitely inspired by a certain time period, which is important, but what about this watch really speaks to you? I think they really nailed, compared to the, the 30020 that we've just looked at, the uh, one thing that's polarizing, I think that's another aspect we could maybe mention, polarizing nature when it comes to just how everything's arranged on a watch, whether it pulls you in one way or the other. The one thing that really polarizes me, at least, with this is the, uh, the teardrop lugs. I think it could have been approached a little bit differently but a bit in a in a bit more of a refined way if you know what i mean with this piece next to it the vacheron with the straight up down lugs there is a more complementary nature to where the lugs the way the lugs work next to the way the case has been done and uh next to just the peculiarity of the dial being being tilted sideways with the crown being set at the top great for people who wear watches on their uh their right hands you know uh or left hand sorry Ultraviolet. Is that the piece you're talking about? Here we go. Sorry, I missed you there. Oh, well, I, I really like the color. Actually, the color, this was a good approach for a Defy. Let's talk about that now. Um, so let's catch up with what everyone else is talking about. Again, I'm missing so many of you here. Uh, JD Granhoy, a minute from Tippy. Again, Tippy, you normally have such, such good suggestions, and I just, you know, as it is, I struggle. I think I said hi to you, bud. Welcome to the show. Okay. <laughs> Ultraviolet is hideous. So what I like compared to the Defy, I mean, look at the Defy's on the left-hand side here. There's, you just can't read them. There's just a mess of details. At least what they've done here is, is approach it in such a way that the bridges, they, they, I've never actually seen this before. The way the bridges blend in with the strap, it's quite unique. It's quite different in that way. Um, the added gray on the dial, the way the gray is divided on the case and the sub dials, also very nice, nice and detailed. And oh, Brummy mentioning Fears watches, definitely need to have a look at those. And Thomas, I just saw your super chat. Thank you. Uh, say hello to Anthony Napoli and Yui. Okay, thank you. So hello to Anthony Napoli and Yui. I hope I got your name right, both of your names. Uh, okay, so the Defy is Defiance from Raymond. Very good. So, you know, on one side, I think Hublot and I think this, this impression, this format. But compared to the watches we're seeing on the left-hand side here, I, I think the Defy generally is quite a mess. There are a few examples that are pretty great. I mean, uh, the Felix Baumgartner version is nice, but <laughs> uh, Kevin, that's good. So I've never seen how a bridge or the bridges inside a watch match the strap, which is quite unique different in that way but geez if purple's your color go for it there's so many elements about this watch that divides opinion which i think is is really the uh, the underlying thing 
uh, Zenith Defy. It's a peculiar brand. The one version that I like here is a um, here's another 21 Panda Dial. I think this was what was asked of me a second ago. Now the Felix Baumgartner version. Felix was the guy who jumped out of um, the Red Bull Stratos. He had a really cool variant of a Panda Dial. Zenith Defy in many ways, but it didn't look hideous compared to the watches that were out at the time. You know, uh, this looks approachable. Surprisingly, looks very approachable. The Panda aesthetic is a beast to itself, you know? Defy is good taste. <laughs> Buganish, that's one of the best lines for the show so far. Defy is good taste. Uh, you know, it's it's all up to opinion. I mean, we haven't even discussed Rolex or, or any other like mainstream brand yet, which is nice. It's a nice take on things. But the Panda aesthetic is definitely a beast all to itself. And if I just type in watch Panda dial, I'm sure we'll get so many. We'll get Rolexes, but we also get... Uh, things like Hamilton's um, Pandemonium. This is from Universal Geneve. The Panda Dial is one is one inspiration. Was this? I think this is the watch that, that Baumgartner used. Of course, the resolution. No, this is the modern one on the bracelet. Okay. Just in general, Panda Dials have man they've really taken the world by storm. Actually, this is a good representation of that aesthetic. And Megan's saying, "Love the Panda." It's it's quite a man. It's down to <clears throat> monotone. This is an example of a watch that is very monotone in the way it presents itself. Simple highlights in places, uh, but the contrast is there. A384 Revival, as Demetrius says in the middle. Uh, Yima Chronograph and the Hamilton, they call it Intramatic. I don't know. Um, Juan's in the chat. I'm sure he'll be able to help us here. But in general, they they manage to do a lot of things. They they present themselves in such a way. Here's the Here's the panda. They've actually been articles written up just about Panda dials because they are just so sought after nowadays. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is up to opinion. You know, it's it's kind of like just because people say they're great, does it mean they're actually great? It's it's the polarizing aspect that I think is nice. They're not as polarizing when you look at them in general. Um, and they also manage to arrange themselves in such a way that makes them great for everyday wear for formal occasions, for sporting occasions, uh, easy to read as Kevin. I mean, that's the ultimate thing. And the, G the GP is a good example of that. There's so many around here. Let's see if I can pull up something. Again, I wasn't specific, but I mean, here is a, I feel like this is an Olympic edition of the Seamaster, sorry, Speedmaster. No, it's not. This is a tribute to moon landing. Uh, I wouldn't say this watch is the easiest to read with the batons, the way they're arranged. But so many pieces, the whole the whole idea of a white dial with the black subdials, it's it's now become a real drawing point that people love. I mean, here's a, an example of a Vacheron overseas in a sim similar layout. Um, yeah, just go on and on and on with these pieces for sure. I really enjoy this. This is a reissue of a first Omega in space, approached quite differently, you know, racing format. CK2988 or 2998. I never get that reference right, but yeah, you're pandering. <laughs> Boom, Jim, that's, that's a good one. Okay, so love the Omega. Yeah, they're also very nice. So in general, we've now jumped to Panda watches and that aesthetic. Talking about legibility and reading the watch, I think is it's very important. Uh, Srijan mentioned Cartier Cloche. Let's pull up a, a Cartier. That'll be nice. I haven't looked up Cartiers in a while. And so it goes. I hope you're enjoying the format. This is how the channel used to start back in the day uh the, the live streams oh wow that is so peculiar how does that work i've never seen this before thank you for this this mention for this piece i do like the sideways format so i'm guessing the idea of this watch was to be something that could be put on a desk to read the time or could it be used as a racing i guess it could be used as a racing watch as well being on your left wrist very interesting nice combination uh, definitely not the tank. I mean, again, it's it's that idea of what speaks to you about the shape of the box. Never seen it before either. I've got a great suggestion. And so it goes. I mean, I saw Juan saying, also love reverse pandas. Another thing. I mean, uh, you can see a lot of them here in some of these shots. This is just a standard panda. But then it's the inverted color scheme as well. Are there any other good examples around? Not really. I mean, Zenith El Primero, would you believe, has... It's incredible just how many variants of the El Primero there are. I mean, just look at them all. It's quite like 
intoxicating seeing it all just in one spot you know it's just a collage of of white dials with black sub dials it's quite a mess you know uh 6263 no bad resolution and so it goes i mean it's one aesthetic that i think is quite universal and unanimously many agree it just works so well because it fits so many occasions it's it's very usable um, and if we are talking about, we've spoken about color schemes earlier on with, with like that highlighted purple finish and everything else. Uh, JLC Atmos, we're talking about Atmos clocks. Um, blue shirt, you're never late. Don't worry about it. It's good having you here. We are just, we're just ranting and raving. Uh, if I pull up a JLC Atmos, I think we're going to be looking at clocks for the most part. Yeah. And if we're on the clock thing, it'll be a, a completely different talk. I mean, this is all, these all, this, this was designed by Mark Newson industrial designer amazing the process that goes into the development of these i want to wear a jlc atmos if they managed to miniaturize this technology just imagine how interesting it would have been right um okay what's another cool piece to look up let me think of something that speaks to us what about okay this could be good rolex uzi submariner i can never get the reference it's a 116613 this is an example of a watch that many speak about. Let's try and get a good shot up. This is from a YouTube page. Uh, tell you, sometimes Bob's watches, this was a good archive. This is a watch that many rant and rave about being such a fascinating piece. It's quite a, it's quite a discussion worthy piece because look, it's a diver. It's something that, that needs to be functional in the water, but at the same time, it's, it's built in, it's dressed up in such a way to be a lot more fashionable and usable. Kevin mentioning maxi lugs or not. Well, I know my answer. Uh, let's, let's actually get a poll going in the chat. This is, this should be fun actually. Uh, maxi for M, N for no maxi. So comment now, what do you think? This piece in particular, do you prefer a maxi case or do you prefer non maxi case? Uh, two tone glass to CQ, that'd be cool. Uh, Bluesy is either loved or hated, Megan, for sure. It's it's almost like, to me, it feels like a watch from the 90s because many of my, my friends' fathers actually gave them down to their sons, which is just amazing. Can you imagine? Um, but in general, the, the color scheme is very peculiar. Blue and yellow goes well together. And let's have a look at the poll. We see lots of no's. Interesting. Let's see, maxi, maxi, no, no, maxi, no, no. Lots of no's. Too many no's. <laughs> it's funny. Um, okay, so talking about glass suits, let's pull it up. And then we can, there was mention about, about root beer GMTs and stuff. Let's talk about that as well. Um, CQ is, is an interesting beast for sure. And we talk about two-tone variants and everything else. This one, this one really speaks to me because I just find it to be such a, a strange beast inspired by the time period when it was made, you know, 60s era, but uses a 50s-esque dial. You know what I mean? Um, Rami saying either that's cool the artifact what I find so interesting about this piece is the color blue used it seems so off-brand for Rolex and speaking of which I think this this color scheme is more on brand for Rolex compared to and let me pull it up what is the I don't know the reference but the Smurf Submariner on the other hand I think is just too blue for what it should be this color scheme for the Smurf, I find is is off kilter. Very nicely said as well. Uh, it's it's peculiar, right? I think the way it, what what makes a Rolex dial is the the radiant effect that it gets. The, the actual the way that it refracts refla, ref, refracts the light itself. Uh, that's one aspect that I think really sells a Rolex dial to me at least. When it's matted, on the other hand, it loses that spark. I mean, that's why the Hulk. Though I don't like the bezel so much, the, the way the dial is arranged, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, so it's yeah, it's it's nice. And many saying that they like both the small small case and the large case. Um, I will look up the, the gold CQ in a sec to be for sure. There was also mentioned about a uh, GMT that I missed out. Uh, let's see, I think Ant Ant mentioned mentioned it a second ago. Uh, would you prefer? I don't know if you'd like to mention it again in a second. Um, but as we do, let's look up the gold. CQ. I didn't know they made a gold, as in two tone, or is it solid? Very nice. Oh wow, this is brand new. This must be brand new. That is stunning. I have never seen this before. I'm sure. Um, 
Watch Advisor must have spoken about this recently. This looks like a new release three days ago. Um, so immediately what I think, this is the thing, this is the problem with, with bronze watches, is that they have now instilled the idea of when you see that kind of finish on a case, you think to yourself, is it bronze or is it gold? And a uh, nice combination. Never seen this before. Here's another more subtle approach. Very interesting. So they're now incorporating gold metals into it. Does it speak as well as the, um, the original models? I think contrast is key. I think it's everything. This example in particular on the left with the, uh, the gold accents on the bezel, on the crown, the actual numerals and hands, very neat, quite elegant. Uh, peculiar though, must say it is very, very peculiar. Uh, Golden Bubba asking me how many watches have I owned? Not that many, yeah, maybe about 10, I would say. Uh, nothing nothing special. The, the best I have is a, is a Seamaster at this point. But I've managed to handle quite a few in my time, which is good. Uh, Hands-on with vintage and modern pieces. I was able to go into Rolex boutiques before the, the pandemic of <laughs> uh, you know, keeping people out for the sake of you know, no steel sports and got some good hands-on time with them. So Angie asking, modern bluesy or root beer? Okay, this lines up very well with these pieces, actually, because... The bluesy with the the yellow gold yellow gold case and everything else the finish, it's it's very bright. I think bright is the best way we could sum up this watch. You just see it on the wrist. I don't know why the screen decides to zoom out like that when I pull in. Mm, it's annoying. Uh, there's another good example on the wrist. Just in general, in in normal light, I would say day to day light as well. It's very bright in your face. You know what I mean. On the other hand. That could be something that speaks to you for sure. But if you want something a bit more toned down, the root beer with the rose gold is something quite unique. And I mean, we've mentioned this. I had a whole video discussing this watch in general, is that the tone of the watch, that could be something that actually adds into the whole discussion of why you're choosing a certain watch. The tone of the watch could be something that really pulls you in. For me in particular, I think the rose gold with the brown and the black is so versatile as an everyday wearing watch. Whether it's solid gold, whether it's it's two-tone itself, this, this color scheme is used with all forms of clothing nowadays. Generally, we're always wearing something that's pretty dark, whether it's you know either black or brown is a color scheme that's used everywhere. It's quite a neutral color, but it is also quite attractive because it's unique. So it goes, I mean, the development there. And that lines up very much with these CQs that we're looking at now because they too try to address the idea of, of two-tone with a rose gold finish. I think what would have made this watch a bit more exciting actually, this one in particular, the solid gold, is if they used a brown finish on the bezel, on the dial possibly, some kind of tropical effect, you know what I mean? Uh, Given it that bit more of a, a neater blend between the gold and the texture on the dial itself. I think the transition between parts is just it's fascinating. It's one of my favorite pieces from the Rolex line in their modern lineup. Um, autumn to winter watch, Brummy says. I mean, definitely. It, it shows off that quality for sure. And re-mentioning a point, when it permits, let's talk field watches. I like the Rolex 1016 or even earlier 50s variants. Okay, we sure can. Field watches are a different breed of pieces. Oh, and is the old root beer called the Clint Eastwood? Yes, it is, Math. Um, 73 math. I don't know the reference. Forgive me. Is it a 1618? Uh, I used to know it. it. Was this 1678 or something like, or 783? I don't know. Um, but they do call it the Clint Eastwood with the tobacco dial and all of that. So let's pull up just field watches in general. And this does kind of line up with what we're talking about. The, the reason why watches work so well. Uh, and this kind of lines up with what we were just speaking about with uh, the brown variants of watches themselves. Um, where's a good example? It's CWC. How's that? These watches you can still find, and they're like they're really affordable. Just a standard field watch, basic, simple principles. So this is definitely not for everyone. It's, it's amazing how some people really don't enjoy field watches because they're just so plain and basic. Thomas mentioning 16753. Let's test your theory, Thomas. I'm going to put that in right now and see. 16753. Thomas is a legend. He nailed it. This is the piece. So this is what they generally classify as the Clint Eastwood. And this is such a good example, by the way. 
my favorite combination of elements this piece for sure not the nipple dial just the standard layout with the uh what would you call it a custard and caramel finish with the tiger's eye explosive dial that's yeah, beautiful it's such a it's such a strange animal and what what is and talking about the theme when we i'm getting lost in translation when it comes to talking about the subject matter itself what about this watch pulls me back for more I think the quirkiness factor is something something unique. Uh, it's definitely something that a watch enthusiast would enjoy because it's just, it's bonkers. It looks so bizarre. It kind of looks infected in a way. It looks a bit septic. <laughs> but then at the same time, it just speaks to that 70s language. The nipple dial is a much better representation of that time period for sure. Uh, damn it. I wish I could get some better. I wish I could pull into these images better. I'm probably going to have to use a different browser in the future. But um, this has a standard matte dial. Let's get another. I'll pull this shot up again. This was good. But going back to that question of asking why, I mean, we're talking about what is it that brings me back to this watch all the time? What's, what's the interesting factor? Things like the interesting quirks. I think this uses an open nine on the date window. That's something nice. The way the numerals are arranged at the, the half positions where the six is cut off, the 18, not so much, it's not very interesting, but the six looks very interesting, you know? Um, the thing is, when would you wear this watch? That's the next question. Is it a watch that you would wear every day? Does it speak to you that much for that reason? Or is it something that you would just wear to show off because it's pretty fun and just out there and, and strange? Yeah, very peculiar piece, but I find it just such a fascinating thing. And there have been some terrific examples out there. I actually had a, um, a solid gold variant of these in my hand with a gorgeous dial, much better dial than this. Call it, they call it a lava dial. And it's, it's an amazing thing. It, was, it had an original rivet bracelet and everything. It was stunning. Okay, so what was I talking about? Field watches. Okay, let's talk about that in a sec. And chrome. Shot in the dark says, yeah, it's cool. Chrome, Chrome's okay. Uh, I should try and... Because the thing is, I run the stream off Chrome, which is a problem. So I can't exactly share this, the stream itself. And I don't know. I'm going to have to find a different browser. Anyway, so let's, what? Triforce Rich. <laughs> Chip Wong consolidates his collection down to three Rainbow Daytona in rose, yellow, white, gold. Got rid of all his Pateks. That's amazing, Triforce. Thank you for that. Okay, let's look at it. I mean, it's the most, what can we say? It lines up with this piece, actually because it is very flashy. It's, it's not something, compared to the modern variant of the rupiah, it's, it's not uh, subtle in the slightest in the way it presents itself. And similarly, let's look at rainbow daytons. <laughs> now, the one thing that bugs me about it is that it's, it's a watch that's so hyped because of the John Mayer interview, and now everyone talks about it because it's, you know, it's obviously it's a collectible watch because it's all set in house. So the value of that drives it up. But we don't like talking about price and everything else. Uh, let's have a good look at this piece and what about it. So Chip Wong bought three of these. That, that's pretty funny. I've never heard of that before. Uh, and it's something. What about this watch really speaks to us in general? <clears throat> I think in a way the color scheme, the way it's arranged, I need to flush out my throat with a coffee. There's a few joining. Chip Gage, great having you. And there was some more joining that I didn't say hi to. Apologies if I didn't uh, reach out to you. There's so many of you in the chat, and it's just it's just ballistic. Okay, so <laughs> tippy. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to hit the coffee for a sec. I'll be with you now. So talking about this piece, I've actually had a bit of time to internalize the bezel. It's pretty masterful, the way the bezel is done. Uh, because the color scheme, it's it's the full palette, you know, you get to enjoy it as if it's a, a Crayola set, you know. There's something so satisfying about a box of, just have a look on the internet or whatever, a box of crayons that you open up and all the colors are just perfectly arranged. You get to see the entire spectrum, you know. And in a way, <laughs> I just had to put on my sunglasses for sure. Uh, and Dan, great having you here. Thank you for joining us. So it's the pride watch. I mean, it's an example of a pride watch for sure. Also like the fact how the batons are arranged on the dial. But then speaking about selling your entire collection and putting your money into these, okay, they're sought after and collectible, but what do these really represent to you as an adult? And I think in a way, 
kind of calls back to childhood in a sense. It's got that playful nature that says that you shouldn't be taking things seriously. You shouldn't take the watch seriously. I mean, the beautiful factor, I think, is the way the lugs are done. I don't know if you can get some better shots of the details in places. Um, maybe just a, a render. No, that's not good. High, high snobiety. No, that's not good. Uh, there's so many examples of these too. There's, there's versions in white gold and, and rose gold and yellow gold. Oh, this is Zoom. I need to have a new browser up next week. I will do it. But it's just the whole the whole layout. The, the diamond setting on the case itself is pretty gorgeous. It's very subtle. But I think the, the real underlying thing that speaks to me at least is color theory. Yes, for sure, Tippy represents color theory. Represents look at me. <laughs> so I think of childhood when I look at this because of just that, that appealing nature of having the entire spectrum on the wrist. It could have been addressed a little bit more subtly maybe, but it is pretty interesting on the whole. Um, and regarding the variants of yellow gold and, and white gold, which speaks the best. Hmm. I kind of like the white gold finish. I don't know. We could spend so much time talking about this for sure. There was mention about looking up the HYT rainbow. <laughs> so again, sticking to the theme of asking why this is, this is a part of your collection. What about this watch speaks to you? I think it's a very important aspect, especially with watches like these. Um, HYT Rainbow. I've never heard of that before. Is that another Rolex piece? I don't know. Uh, watch, I'm going to say. Not Hut Rainbow Watch. What the? HYT. Oh, wow. Much better. <laughs> this is much better. Now, immediately we see the skull and crossbones. I don't know. I've never seen this piece before. Kind of reminds me of that. Is it supposed to represent that uh, gadget, those needles, where you stick your face in it or your hand and it, and it pushes out the impression? How does this thing tell the time? Interesting. Oh, 11, 12, 1. I see it has this, this, this glow around the dial. Yeah, I mean, we can get to the obscure stuff and it will just be a mess. You see what I mean? How the, how the, the stream generally just transcends into chaos eventually. Um, 73 math saying 166, blah, blah, blah. References for Rolexes can get quite hairy. 1, 1, 6, 5, 8, 8, TBR. Is that a Rolex? Oh, yeah, perfect everyday watch for sure. Now, actually, come to think of it, compared to the, um, the other variant with the brown, the brown finish, as, as far as leopard, or they call it eye of the tiger, Rorschach dial, that is, this is a much better example. And this feels exactly like, let me pull it up, my, one of my favorite Pateks, actually, Patek Ellipse uh, Gold. I think it was for an anniversary. Uh, where is it? 40th anniversary, maybe, no, 50th anniversary or 60th, I don't know. There it is. This piece to me, I think is just so charming. Um, of course, it doesn't come up with a great in image. Uh, 50th anniversary reference. This remind that, that Rorschach piece reminds me very much of this Baroque styling effect. Great suggestion from 70, it was 73 math. Great suggestion for this piece. Uh, I love I love how we just jump around the discussion. Usually, uh, we were talking about field watches a second ago, and um, what's my take on Corum watches? Zombie, I need to have a look at it. I haven't actually followed Corum. It's a brand that I haven't looked at at all. Uh, and it's mentioning it looks like an owl. Now this dial, it's fascinating. It really is. I never thought I would say that about a watch. I'm sure I've seen this in the past, but I never thought I'd say that about this particular variant. Um, the whole idea of diamond setting everywhere. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty artful, but the dial is what brings me back. In fact, that aspect of how the dial is arranged, it's quite entrancing, don't you say? It speaks, it speaks about, you know, the, the way it's, it's laid out. It's, it's fascinating. It really is. I'm just, I'm stumbling over words because I'm trying to read the chat at the same time. Um, uh, and this has a, yeah, it's, what a peculiar and interesting looking watch. I'm quite interested in it, honestly. Um, great suggestion. I mean, we talk about bizarre and weird things. There was a mention about what would be good. Uh, how about an idea for a podcast? Ugly watches. Yeah, we could definitely do that one day. But then ugly is so subjective because, I mean, like some, some people think the AP Royal Oak is the ugliest watch on the planet, uh, where others, I, I feel divided. <laughs> some days I think it's gorgeous. Other days I think it's hideous. But... This dial layout reminds me of this, this 50th anniversary ellipse. 
stunning, really interesting piece to bring up for a change. And there was a, I couldn't wear to a pub, would not get out alive for sure. Um, Orange Hand, check out the Corum Golden Bridge. We're always talking about high horology stuff. It's hilarious. And I wanted to talk about um, field watches. I don't know how we got off that subject. I want to discuss field watches for a sec, and I'm spelling it wrong every single time. So when we speak about the reason why we get into watches, what is the, the appeal? I've been thinking about this long and hard because for the last, uh, I'd say two weeks, three weeks, I've been writing about field watches in particular, you know, military issued pieces for service. And what these pieces really represent, is there, are there better examples or is this good to speak about? So on the one side, we have a Hamilton khaki. On the other, we have a Benrus, uh, do they call it a, a B1? I don't know. I did a video about Vietnam and those watches. But, and I've just lost my chat. Hold on a second. Just refreshing the page. So addressing field, field watches are their own, they have their own genre to themselves. And I think it's, it's worth just briefly talking about this. It will be mentioned in uh, the field watch reviews and videos. But there's something about the way these watches present themselves as being utilitarian, but also something that we can nowadays wear for all occasions. And that really was the underlying detail that made them so, so popular or have made them so popular is that they, they just work in any situation. And when I think about a graduation watch or a watch that you give to you know, your child as he, as he goes to high school or she, if she goes to high school, she's interested in the more masculine stuff. Um, this to me, as a university watch, as a high school watch, is something just so timeless. It teaches you to really enjoy the hobby because it's mechanical, you know, it's hand wound. So you get to appreciate winding it every day. You put your energy into it. All of these little things play into the, the equation, very much how we addressed the why as to why you should be picking up watches in the first place. There is that, that ele element of romance, as dear artifact said, that emotional emotional connection you need with the watch and to me i think field watches manage to capture that very well and there are so many examples i mean the the w10 for me is something that's really caught my attention uh, it was never a watch that really spoke to me much at first because i hadn't I hadn't spent time with it of course and that's something you have to do when you're dealing with watches it's get some wear time and see what it's like but it's the it's the idea of the simple aesthetics that makes it so effective, easy to read, easy to tell the time, but then you get the, the size and scale. There's lots of talk about scale being too small, of course. Um, there's mention about field watches and Tudor Ranger, North Flag from Kevin. Let's pull up that as well. I wanna try and migrate away from the high, high horology stuff and talk more about the stuff that um, we enjoy on a more practical, basic level. Speaking of which, Dear Artifact may have spilled the beans. He's found something quite interesting that the Ranger is no longer available on Tudor's website and that we have a strong feeling that we're going to be seeing a reissue of one of these buttes this year or, uh, or next year. I don't know when that'll be coming out, but uh, if they bring out one of these pieces, I mean, geez, it'll have a, a good shot. And for anyone who's joining, this is what I'm wearing. Smith's Everest on a Jubilee, just fitted it. Lines up with these two, you know, 1016 style case. Uh, the aesthetics are very much the same. It's just such a practical watch, it's great. Um, but getting back to field watches, they are in their own league and they deserve the attention they get, I think. Uh, it's, it's a watch that I truly believe someone can buy and get into the hobby with. Uh, speaking of which, Craft and Tailored, this is his photo. Check out Craft and Tailored on YouTube, please. All of you who are watching in future or currently, uh, Cam does some amazing reviews on some gorgeous watches. You won't see the cleanest, you, you'll never see such clean vintage watches on this space. Highly recommend you have a look at his stuff. So what's another example of a good field watch? We've just looked at Hamilton's and, and everything else. Um, I mean, we've already spoken about them pretty, pretty detailed. Uh, what's another example? CWC Diver, maybe. How's that? There's, there's just too much, too much to talk through as it is. But all of these pieces, the whole idea, the one, the one aspect that I think many people have, have caught onto nowadays at least, they want watches that are practical for everyday use, that are great utilities, so you don't have to worry about them. But then at the same time, they need to be something that, that speaks to you as, as something of a different time maybe when it comes to reissues and everything else. Tippy mentioning Hamilton W10, great example. Let's pull that up. 
Hamilton W10 used all sorts of little cues, but also had a cushion case around it. It's such a good shot, watch lounge. So field watches, again, I'll reiterate, something that I think as a community, we should try and push further and further. For anyone getting into this hobby, there's not much that really beats a field watch as something that you can just enjoy, where give this to your son, maybe your daughter when she goes to high school or graduates university or starts university. It'll get the person really appreciating the hobby because of the simple things, because it's hand wound, because it's basic, it's small, it's out of the way. Um, it's, it's something that tells you the time, but it also, the beauty and the aesthetics is that it's functional. Um, so Zin, be ur, <laughs> be cool. Yeah, let's do that. I haven't looked at Zin watches for a while. Um, oh, geez, spelt that wrong. There are so many pieces out there, and it's just, as you think you're, you're getting through it, so you, you hit another, another part. So here's another example of a Flieger-inspired piece. Speaking of which, I, was, I sent a very interesting email today about reviewing a possible Flieger from World War II. <laughs> it would be pretty cool. Uh, wish Hamilton put that little arrow on the dial for the reissue zombie. And they don't do that. That's I didn't even notice. I'm surprised, actually. Technically, you're not allowed to do it unless it is a military issue piece. I think that's probably the reason why. And now looking at my screen, I can see the resolution is so bad because the, uh, the image manages to pull itself away. Interesting combination of elements with the quarters and those details. Yeah, but as it is, we, we are getting away from the subject matter. I think I'm going to pull up that Hamilton again because that was pretty easy to follow. Let me just jump back a couple of clicks. So I think the main reason why they haven't done it for this piece, which is pretty sad, but it's down to since it's not military issued, technically, they're not allowed to do it. I, I think they actually need rights. A brand needs rights to do that sort of thing. Um, to incorporate, you know, NATO stocking numbers on the case back and, and everything else. The broad arrow is a rune from Chili Prepper. Thank you. So other mentions, there's, there's chat in the talk in the chat, chat in the talk. Um, to be saying Marathon Watch is a Canadian brand that officially approved by the government. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's stunning. Pretty cool how we jumped across to field watches now. Uh, Dear Artifact saying, per my comment earlier, there's no better style of watch that you can attach narrative than to, to a field watch. Literally made for adventure. I mean, that's it. And it's taken me wearing it, wearing a few of them to really catch that bug. Um, and what's amazing is for the first time, it's a watch that I can just appreciate as something that tells me the time and nothing else. I couldn't necessarily do that beforehand. Um, as much as I enjoy this piece, it's not a watch that I can constantly wear every day. I don't know. I need something like a bezel to, to work it. But what I've learned from, from handling a field watch is there's just a bit more romance in the idea of just not knowing the time. It's the kind of watch that I would wear on a Sunday, manually wound, no date to set, no bezel to use, just time. And you get to enjoy all the little details like texture on the dial, like the numerals, the rail dial, etc. cetera. Um, thoughts on Dan Henry. It's a brand I don't know. Uh, from what I've heard, it's a micro brand of some kind. And they're dealing with Miyota, no, not Miyota's, Seiko, Seiko VK64 movements very much inspired by, um, by Hamilton chronographs from back in the day, I think. Stanley asking me, do you consider the Explorer to be a field watch? I think if any watch in the family, in the Rolex family, is one that approaches that area, I think the field watch, technically it is. Uh, the, both the Explorer and the Ranger line originally were made for, uh, well, not, not necessarily, the Ranger has a bit more provenance in that area as being a watch made for the purpose of climbing sorry, not climbing, exploring the uh, North Greenland expedition. So these watches were given to explorers to go and check out the place. Technically, there were field watches in the 50s. Um, oh, geez, I tell you, when it comes to using this, my magic mouse hand, technically, these were field watches in the 50s. But um, that, as when we talk about the Rolex Explorer, it definitely has that utilitarian aspect. We could even go so far to say the Explorer line in general is supposed to be in that field. I mean, uh, a GMT complication with a set bezel, very much like a field watch in many ways, you know, with the 24 hour time. And mention from Neil about the Glycine Airman, another great example. And I hope you're all enjoying the comments in the chats and you're just keeping up with each other because that's good. I mean, that's, that's really what makes this such a fun discussion. Uh, Zombie saying, I like your name, Zombie Boozer. Well, did you come back from the dead? 
by any chance. It's pretty cool. <laughs> if you were to redesign the Hamilton, if I were to redesign the Hamilton, I'd make a 38 mil matte blue dial with California. Interesting, with a California dial. Do I still have it on? Yes, I do. So the thing is, what, what really made these watches, it's, you know, it's sad to say, but what made these watches so attractive, so, so user-friendly, was that they were general issue. You know what I mean? They were watches that were just made to be used, and that's it. Uh, and because of that, they couldn't have things like polarizing elements. California dial, for example, just many in the military wouldn't be able to read the time, for example. I mean, guys wouldn't understand the Roman numeral split. Uh, blue dial, is it as effective as a black dial? Would it attract too much attention when you're wearing this over your fatigues and things like that? Great point, though. I mean, you could do so many things with these pieces to jazz them up a bit. Uh, the beauty in the field watch is its monotony. <laughs> and I think, I mean, here is an original. The beauty of a field watch is its monotony. That's, uh, that's a pretty good statement there. Maybe I'll use it in the write-up. I don't know. Yeah, but I'm working on a write-up on uh, the W10 and the M Ministry. They all fall in the same, same region. Bugan is saying, come on, man, Roman numerals aren't tough. I tell you, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm left-handed, so what, what can you expect? I'm dyslexic with Roman numerals most times. But... Uh, I'm sure some people might also struggle. Anyway, G-Shock. There was talk about G-Shocks. I mean, now we're getting into this, bizarrely. We've still got the high horology Vacheron on the screen. It's great. Uh, and there were some other pieces that I haven't pulled up that I'll try and get to eventually. But here is another example of a watch. I mean, this is pretty cool in green. If it ever loads up. No, it won't. Uh, here's the Casio Oak, I think they call it nowadays. Um, when we talk about choosing a watch and just as to why, this definitely fits. I really enjoy the, the NASA variant. Are there some good pictures here? This, this watch really talks to the why you're picking it up. And for most of us, it's for the sake of being active, you know, being out there, using it heavily uh, with no remorse, no real love. Uh, and it's pretty incredible that these watches have seen such a development. When we talk about industrial design and watches, there's, there are very few that have managed to achieve so much as, as this piece, when we think about it. Still toying with the idea of coming up with a series, like designing my own G-Shock, sharing it with you, and having like a, a three-part series where I get some hands-on and do some sketches and share them with all of you. Of all the watches, I can draw a G-Shock fine, but... Um, Megan mentioning the new British Army G-Shock has been released. Ooh, let's have a look. Haven't heard of this. Is that a thing? Let's see. Is this the latest? Does this, does this mean it's actually standard issue? A uh, British Army edition G-Shock. Mudmaster, that is amazing. I love when a brand, I mean, speaking of which, when a brand is able to collaborate and bring out a watch that's actually going to be used in service, I mean, this is fantastic. Thank you for this mention, Megan. Um, so <clears throat> this watch, when it comes to industrial design and being quite a monumental piece in that area, it's really, I think I mentioned this in the write-up about pieces in general. Uh, what was it? The watches of the British Armed Forces. This piece really has been able to capitalize on so many areas when it comes to being this functional instrument that can be used everywhere and anywhere. Um, and again, I'm looking at my laptop and I'm seeing that the, the image is so bad and poorly arranged. I hope, no, let's try and get something better up. It's, I need to keep the, the screen moving all the while talking over it. So I hope, this is pretty good. I hope you can see this okay. So G-Shock has been able to really capitalize on aspects like, like color usage, things like, I mean, we see carbon fiber around here. We see rubber. We see the use of screws, fixtures, um, it's, it's amazing. And then talk about all the complications, altimeters, uh, chronograph, compass, connect. I guess it has some Bluetooth aspects. It's an atomic clock. It has all sorts. Great piece. It's nice to talk about this for a change. So when we talk about field watches and these pieces in general, they are very versatile. And we mainly pick them up because they are watches that we can take anywhere and use anywhere. And it's, it's what makes them appealing to us. So answering the, reason, answering the question why for these watches, not very difficult. The main reason is just because they are so versatile for outdoors. I mean, this is called a mud man or, or mud master. So you can understand that this is just used and abused. So G-Shocks I enjoy the most are the ones with analog dials. 
I think analog hands really completes the watch nicely, gives it a bit more of a, um, you know, analog old school, old school effect, which makes it a bit more interesting for watch enthusiasts, at least. Um, the Tron G-Shock was mentioned. Okay, let's have a look at that now. I need to take another swig of coffee or else I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choke on my uh, dryness. This is pretty cool. <laughs> but, I mean, we talk about polarizing. Look at it now. There's so many variants. We really had purple and, and uh, other color schemes in the show, but this is, this is a pretty good example of a watch that would defy, divide opinion for the most part. Is this this doesn't loom. This is actually just the way the dial is arranged without any light hitting it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so Tippy mentioning the JD. Have you mentioned already? Let's get to it now. I love this Patek ellipse. JD. I haven't even been looking at the time. What how have the show how's the show been running? I feel like it's been two hours, no? An hour and a half. Pretty good, you know? Pretty good. So now we get to the real Jacques Hedro. Thank you for that. That helps. I mean, I think we've actually used this watch in the show before. It's great. Thank you for this, Tippy. Um, speaking about the specifics and the details on the dial, this one just takes it all the way back. Uh, Sub-seconds on the left, hours, minutes. And when it comes down to purity and looking at a watch simply to be a thing that tells you the time and does it well, I mean, the case, <clears throat> the case styling is beautiful as well. Really stands nicely. Uh, is this a good example? No. Let's keep scrolling around and finding something good. But again, jumping back to the, the subject matter, which I'm trying to do, with regards to what watch speaks to you and why, what about this watch really sings to you? Is it the simplicity that you enjoy so much? Um, is it the fact that it is just plain and basic? Uh, do you prefer a watch that is not complicated, like in this example? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up another piece. Uh, let's just pull up the W10 for a second while I get a fisherman's friend out because I can feel the voices getting aggressive this show is proudly sponsored by fisherman's friend black current it's not the best flavor but it's pretty good and i want to read some of your chats because i have not been i've been uh, just talking the entire time <laughs> it's been 90 minutes <laughs> it's nuts how fast these shows go most of the time so i want to try there's there's 200 of you watching now which is unbelievable um I want to now get back into just highlighting the, the crib sheet that we had in the beginning of the show, maybe. Just very briefly discussing elements on the watch that work and just why. And um, it's a very important aspect that needs to be addressed with regards to just what about the watch sings to you the most. And we can, we can juggle this discussion over and over again. Again, if you'd like to mention more pieces that uh, you are interested in, picking up possibly we can have a look at them in more detail let's pull up this jd again it does look pretty gorgeous this this dial arrangement is something very striking you notice that the dial itself has got a textured matte finish to it which is a nice element megan mentioning the moza mbf collaboration that is fan that is a fantastic looking watch very much like these actually i'm going to pull it up now thank you for that megan um okay i'm going to do that now actually very nice. Moza watches. Moza has done some amazing stuff. And I think they're, they're just going from stride to stride. What's a good example? Wouldn't it be amazing if I got some of these pieces on the show to review? What is going on here? The image, as I click away, so the image loads. So if I'm not wrong, the way the case and the crystal is designed, let's get a good shot here. That is fantastic. So the kiss, the, the crystal, uh, here we go. So Moser is quite known for their use of sparsity with a lot of their pieces. I mean, the Swiss Alps watch, they've done a few variants that just have hours on hours and minutes on the dial. This new collaboration, I mean, just look at the way it's been arranged. The idea is that the, the glass itself is domed. What it allows is for the, the actual dial to sit proud. You can see it's sitting at an almost, what would we say, 75 degree angle facing the wearer. It's quite an optical illusion, and sadly, these are beautiful. I mean, what I what I laugh at is the balance bridge is in the center. You can't exactly read the time. I mean, the time is in the corner, and the power reserve is at the base. So yeah, they they've definitely tried to jump on. I love this color scheme, though. It reminds me of like a fifties American American car, you know, with fins and everything else. Uh, this is a photo from Deployant, 
now we get a better understanding of just how the dials are arranged. So it's a proper flying tourbillon sitting in the dial. I mean, this is just craft work. What a piece of art. It's beautiful. I really enjoy the idea that the, the dial is sitting proud, so you don't have to you know, look down at it too much. So a few more questions. Vintage JLC Mimivox next to my list from Emily. We actually looked at that at the beginning of the show. We looked at a tribute to Deep Sea, but a Mimivox is just stunning for sure. Um, thank you for this mention uh, from Megan, and I think Tippy also mentioned the MBF. It's it's gorgeous. I think it's just so out there and unique, interesting. Okay. Uh, Megan saying got a call from the other week. Wow. The blue the blue Fume dial looks stunning. I mean, look at this. I don't know how well you can see the shot here if I pull in so it zooms out, but you get a good idea of, I don't know why it does this to me. Look at that color. It is stunning, outstanding. Okay. So... Dear Artifact saying, I don't usually enjoy horturology, but that red dial is amazing. Pretty incredible. I can, I can honestly say, there's one thing about Moser that works is that they just know how to address their dials. They've got greens, blues, reds, the whole, the whole package. And there's a few variants in their family that really are striking. So with a watch like this, this is a statement. This is not something as an everyday piece. This is something that you wear on a special occasion. And the way it presents itself, it, it wants to be seen. You know what I mean? Um, Tom is saying cylindrical hairspring on the Moser version, double hairspring on the MBF Legacy machine. <sighs> Stunning. A zombie Boozer saying, I'm a hardcore FF7. I don't know how, but um, tiny kid. FF7 edition, Seiko Presage, automatic chronograph is ugly. <laughs> okay, we can have a look at that. I haven't looked at any Seikos, actually. Um, a watch to wear without setting the time because it doesn't matter. I mean, that's the thing. Look how small that subdial is. I don't know if we can get a better example easily wouldn't call it a sub dial but the hands are just it, the thing is the hands will get hidden by the actual balance bridge which is pretty hilarious fascinating though i mean talk about an approach very organic i think that's what speaks to me about these watches the most is not just the color schemes you know we're talking about green and and blue representing you know, grass and water but uh, the dome crystal is something pretty unique that the whole effect the way the cases are designed on these pieces with these gorgeous cut out segments but then it's also just the way the dial is arranged. Circular. Circular seems to be something they tend to play with a lot. Um, and dealing with a dial that doesn't have any numerals or batons or anything on it, it's pretty bold. You can't exactly tell the time very easily. I mean, you just, you just don't know where to look for this example. You know what I mean? Now, this is a bit easier to understand. But this, I mean, what's up, what's down, <laughs> what's 10, what's 11, you know what I mean? Um, so Triforce Rich asking me, am I a, a, a Gundam fan? I've seen Gundam Spring Drive Seiko Limited Edition. No, I haven't. So let's have a look at that. I can honestly say I, I tend to focus more on the, the Swiss side of pieces. I try my best to uh, get into the... <laughs> I've never seen this before. We've just gone into a completely different area. Um, gorgeous, though. I do love the color schemes. Lines up very much with what we've spoken about earlier. This is pretty amazing. So I guess this was a Japanese TV show back in the day, and they've now brought these pieces out to pay tribute to them. It's great. I love that red, and it reminds me of the, the Seiko tuner in a way. Um, interesting case styling and everything else. It's great how we've suddenly jumped to, to watches with a bit of flash and color scheme, you know what I mean? Um, street tuner. <laughs> Position of the crowns. Are we talking about this piece or the um, the Moser? Notice how, I mean, I think more brands should really think about how their crowns crowns are arranged at the four o'clock position because it's just so practical. Um, I really I really feel for people who wear watches on their left hands and have the crowns digging into their wrists. I think it's must be terrible, right? Um, having it offset just means that it doesn't get in the way and it's it's not an irritant. So pretty amazing. Um, Okay, so where to go next? That's the question. Here's another example of a crown, just well-placed, out of the way. You know what I mean? Um, I'd like to see a camo version from Les. Um, yeah, so and the shroud comes off, and this is talking about this piece as well, thanks to Eric. So this outer shroud comes off. What a peculiar monster. I do really enjoy the color schemes. Any watch in a, a, a drab finish is a winner because it's just so practical, you know what I mean? Um, very stylish. I think the red is also very striking too. 
Yeah, Seiko does some incredible stuff. They really approach their their ideas in a different way. I like that they've they've managed to find they, they've really established their own footing. I don't know how you could describe them as a brand. It's it's stylistic, um, but every model has its own elements that makes it unique. Uh, I would say their creative department is pretty on point compared to so many other brands nowadays. You know what I mean? Um, to clean sediment. Thank you for that, Eric. So that's how the divers work. You can actually detach these external locking cases. So I guess that helps with the pressure, right? A thousand meter. It's a thousand meter diver. So in order to keep it locked in, this outer case can then be removed if you want to clean the insides. And I guess that eliminates the need for a helium release valve or are these actually gas release valves? I don't know. Are these buttons pushed to open the case up? Interesting, though. Um, nice combination. <laughs> the Japanese are crazy with their giant robots. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, any more examples? Let's just, I just want to get back to basics and look at something like the Black Bear 58 and speak a bit more about the subject on, on hand. When we're referring to watches and why we get into them and what's made, you know, we, we know that these watches are very popular. There's a, I'm sure there's a few watching the show at the moment that have this watch on. Um, and Dear Artifact summed it up so well a couple of weeks back, saying that Tudor managed to address this watch in a way that made the audience want it. They, they approached it in such a way um, to appease the audience, appeal to the audience, however you want to say it. And again, it's, it's a very monotone watch. It's basic for that reason. So it's not up everyone's alley for sure. But then it's talking about the size and scale of the piece and how it works on the wrist, um, who wears it, how you can wear it, where you can wear it. Truth is saying much better. Robert's saying nope. So the one aspect that I think could be improved, and we've spoken about this often, the hour hand being a, a snowflake, it would be so nice to see pencil hands on the watch fully. But uh, you see, at the same time, we can talk about the, the divisive elements when it comes to talking about subs and everything. Um, I would go with the 58, but a five-digit sub is not much more money, Chili Prepper mentions. And it's funny because there's that, that level in the community where people say, well, it's a Tudor, it's a poor man's Rolex, and that whole argument that's been spoken about to death. I do love the fact that their watches are not in-house made, so they have their own approaches. But there have been issues and errors with the movements in the past, which, I mean, some 58s have had issues before. Um, but then it's dealing with things like the rivet bracelet aspect. Let me just, okay, and in contrast, let me just pull up a, a 14060 because you know it has to be done. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I have the Seamaster. I love the Seamaster. I would never sell it because it's, it's a pretty special watch to me in many ways. Uh, let's just look at this. We can talk about supercase just in general again do you prefer supercases or non supercases um where is a good image that we can use is that decent no hmm watch club they take great stuff so when you're dealing with a watch like this i mean this is the og and this is the original this is what everyone loves so when you're dealing i mean this is a great point talking about pricing and that the 58 is uh, relatively the same price same priced I wouldn't say it is, though. I mean, there's quite a difference in prices, no? Um, five digits is double the money, as Trifor says. I'm not someone who studies prices of pieces. But anyway, uh, speaking of this, I think, you know, the Submariner was really a watch. The design styling really got me interested in watches when I was a kid. Um, I didn't know anything about watches back in the day. Didn't even know it was a Rolex, but the aesthetics, pretty gorgeous. And Tippy mentioning that the, the Tudor P01 price has increased. That's incredible. And I guess it's... It's now that the, the trickling in effect that it's going to be demanded and interested in because it's a prototype, it's something unique and different from the brand. People are thinking it's going to gain value or retain it back in the day. Uh, Chili saying, I wore a supercase all last summer and then sold it for a deep sea Sea Dweller 44. That's so. And Chili, if I'm not wrong, you have not only that Sea Dweller, but you also have um, the what's it the one one six six zero zero as well you have the the vintage no not that yeah just just as we transition to the ceramic case you know the ceramic bezel um so it's it's a cool argument it's talking about versatility bringing this discussion back to the whole idea of uh the why you're getting this watch now this is something we should discuss just because people tell you it's a good watch is it a good watch um of course you have to you have to definitely listen to people who've done this for a long time and have experienced these pieces in the past and have lived. I mean, there's no better testament than someone saying, 
this has been my only watch and it's all I've ever worn for you know 50 years so I mean there is there is some good marketing in there for sure but then again are you buying this watch because people are telling you that it's a good watch that it's a watch that everyone must have therefore and uh, the whole real underlying detail about this this discussion and argument is questioning what do you really want out of the watch do you want it to be something that you want or is it something that has been suggested to you by so many the crazy thing is i could sit and do five five separate videos on the black bear 50, no not the black bear 58 i don't know the p01 as we were just talking about and i'll pull one up just for the sake of argument and for some fun <laughs> the p01 is a, it's a strange beast but as mentioned it's going up in value which is well you know second hand gray hand gray gray market i could make five videos on this watch and say this is just the best watch ever made it's fantastic it's brilliant and someone might catch on and make a video about it as well and so it goes and so it goes eventually there comes a time when people just unanimously accept it's a, it's a brilliant watch because it just is but you need to substantiate that with something so and in this case uh, the video I made about this piece I'll put it in the corner if I decide to come and do a replay and look at this um, I discussed how it's a prototype watch that exhibits how it was developed in the way it's presented and it's very seldom that we see a watch that shows the in-between you know the, the case isn't finished as well as it could have been it's all sharp and uh, the, the actual you know, usage of the bezel itself is just makes no sense <laughs> because I mean it's uh, it doesn't have a ratchet it has a ratcheting feature that was so archaic when you consider what the actual uh, how the actual ratcheting finish how the strap actually no what am i saying i'm losing my thought how the bezel actually managed to ratchet at the end of the day was such a simple approach compared to what they were experimenting with back then um, but then we're talking about this piece this piece has a lot more behind it a lot more story narrative people have have definitely focused in on it because it is like one of the quintessential watches that represents the brand um yeah there's so many things to talk about in this area for sure i've tried to i've tried to bring the discussion back around to the why you should get into these pieces and megan mentioning we're talking about deep sea sea dwellers come thursday next week i'm talking all about deep sea sea dwellers by the way uh challenger the challenger ultra what is the, the deep sea challenge and the uh sea master ultra deep so that should be good um and catching up with all of you here, there's just more and more chats. 73 Math saying, been looking at the Grand Seiko SBGK005. Love the design. Let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at it. I think these Moser pieces are stunning. This red dial, oh my goodness. That is gorgeous. Okay, so it's Grand Seiko. I always struggle with these references. I don't know how you guys actually managed to remember these. If you do, uh, it's nuts. Okay. I've seen this. We've actually featured this on the show before during Wrist Shot Week. So this piece, I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting piece for many reasons. Actually, when we talk about the uh, the case styling, is the one aspect that I think draws many people to it. And this image is way too small to use. Uh, gorgeous brown and rose gold, though. Oof, that is beautiful. So when it comes to talking about this watch, and again, this Magic Mouse is just not cooperating. Looking at the case styling, reminds you of the 70s, you know, the 70s inspired pieces. Kind of has that 70s Hamilton aesthetic to it, you know what I mean? Um, but then the dial itself, the arrangement is very much Grand Seiko. The finishing, I don't think you'll be able to see very well, unfortunately. But the finishing on the dial has an amazing effect. There's a good example. I'm going to try and hold the mouse here so you can see it. It has this, like, what would you call it, a rainfall sunburst effect almost, you know? Um, it's beautiful and it's it's pretty striking I would say it represents the brand very well and that's that's something important balance on the dial as well and G says the offsetting of the power reserve and the sub seconds is gorgeous um, and that's something too which also lines up with this piece in particular uh, talking about watches that represent their brands is that another aspect that draws you in I mean a lot of people gravitate towards I just pulled up this picture again uh, People gravitate to watches like the Black Bear 58, the 14060, Grand Seiko, they pick up the Snowflake, for example. Um, they're watches that very much high, you know, sum up what the brand is trying to do, what it represents. Therefore, is that what appeals to you in that area? Curtis mentioning, 
How about a design competition doing an SKX 007-009 with current mods available? You know what I'll submit. <laughs> Easy for viewers with no rendering skills to do. As in, so as in, I get submissions of Seiko, uh, remade Seikos, or, or should I say modified Seikos, and then feature them as a, as a show of some kind, or just as a presentation. That'd be a lot of fun, you know? I mean, it's a pretty popular subject, and I'm sure lots of people would like to get involved. That could be something. Speaking of which, next week we're going to do wrist shot week. So if you'd like to, if you're watching now, send me an email. I think my email is in the description of this video of your wrist shot, and it'll be featured on next week's show over the weekend on Saturday. Um, okay. So, yeah, talking about brand representation, I think that's what we were doing. Kurt, Carlos saying, great to have you here, Carlos. I haven't said hi to you. Rolex brand representing watch would be a date just or a day date. Hmm. Nicely said. And... Let's actually pull up some day dates or date. Let's, yeah, date mm, date just. I I've enjoyed writing about date just recently. There's lots of things. This is my favorite example, by the way. I think this is very striking. Um, there's some aspects to the date just that I think are very important. The one the the question that was asked of me. It's a great question, and it made me think. I should have actually spent more time talking about it. But um, is the date just becoming obsolete as a watch? And by that we mean, is it being taken over by the sports watch in the category? And for the most part, it kind of is. You know, it's it's losing its traction, which is pretty sad, but it's kind of acceptable because, I mean, it, it's really a watch of its time. It represents uh, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. But then they have made some amazing, I mean, this this rendition looks so modern in the way it's done. I wish I could get some better images up, but sadly... Sadly, it's very difficult. I mean, we'll just have to look at some renders. Um, what I like so much about this configuration in particular and why this watch, speaking about the subject of choosing your next watch, what to look out for, this piece, the date just is famous because it was the world's first rotating date window. And uh, it's an amazing achievement. When it comes to a complication, it's, it really set the standard. You know what I mean? This example in particular... Fluted bezel, jubilee bracelet, batons, simple, elegant, and the biggest highlight is the date window. The way the batons are arranged, it, it pulls your attention to the date window. And for that reason, you're able to see the, mo the, the main focal point very easily. So it very much epitomizes what the date just is, in my, in my opinion. I think the, uh, the elegant factor with the bracelet and the bezel lines up well. The, that the sporty nature kind of lines up with the, the batons, but then having that focus, a cyclops lens even, on the, the date window itself, uh, it's, it's beautiful. It really is a gorgeous thing. So, yeah, the, the whole watch, yes and no. It is becoming obsolete when we think about what the market wants, but at the same time, it has a history that is indelible, can't be erased. It will always be a date just popular, the, the one watch that really defined I mean, it's, it's the watch that really defined the 20th century in many ways. It was one of the most important pieces of that time. Because of that, the history, pretty amazing. It's talking about crashing bikes and stuff. What are we saying? Off the ground. Uh, had to pick up my bicycle. I had to pick up a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, I see. So, Carl, Carl welcome to the show. Uh, he had to pick up a motorcycle, and people are saying, did you drop it uh, off the ground? Tom Austin, great to have you here. Uh, Junior Johnson says, I had mine 49 years, still love it. And I mean, that's the thing. As, as far as watches are, uh, like highlighting their brands, this one does it. I think the Submariner 2, those two watches together, pretty great. Uh, it's incredible just how, rep, how these watches, especially in the Rolex family, have been able to really, they're, they're so un they're noticeable. You just know exactly what the brand is when you see it. Um, I think Tudor is going the same way, but again, they're adopting similar aesthetics as, as other pieces, you know, as it is. Anyway, we've run, been running for two hours. I'm going to, we can talk about a few more pieces before we end the show, but I don't want to drag this on too long uh, because this very much feels like a solid presentation <laughs> and uh, it gets to a point when the brain starts, starts shutting down on this end. So if you have any more suggestions or pieces that you've been considering that you might think are, are poignant and, and good to use on the show in particular, talking about choosing your next watch and what things you should be focusing in on, in on. Um, so I think, again, just trying to bring it all back again, the why factor 
How about the Aquas, Oris Aquas? That's a good example, very good idea. When it comes to picking up a watch, there's, I mean, I we've barely scratched the surface as normally is the case. I mean, that little checklist that I made, it's pretty pathetic because I mean, there's so many other factors. There's price dependency, there's, um, what's a good example, blue dial or green dial? I think I'm gonna stick with the blue dials. Is that pretty good? It's pretty bearable. There's price dependency, there's usability, it's, it, there's so many, Chopard Alpine Eagle, that is, that's pretty hilarious. Let's have a look at that as well. What a peculiar animal. Funnily enough, I was going to do a show, I was thinking about doing a show solely on Lunga, and that got scrapped at the last minute because I wanted to talk about the subject, but maybe not next week, but the week after, we can just focus, have a more dedicated show on a certain brand like Lunga, for example. That could be some fun, just chatting about everything about the watch over the course of an hour or so. Okay, so uh, what was I was saying, talking about pricing and usability and where you're going to use it, I think all of those things also play a part. Transitioning away from the date chest, which is the more elegantly designed piece of a different time, we move to what the market now wants, which is something that is utilitarian, basic, simple, has something like a bezel so you can use it more practically on a daily basis. There's just so many factors that play into the equation. So the Oris Aquas is a, is a peculiar animal. I'm gonna talk about it now <laughs> for the watch, the number two fun. Chip, thank you so, so much. And I see Thomas, you guys are so great. Thank you so much for the super chats. This is definitely going to go towards a project that I wanna work on, designing some graphics and coming up with some kind of branded material, T-shirts or coffee mugs or whatever else, gonna do something. And 73 Math saying, being considering the, the Zen U50, better size than the U1, your thoughts on the design. The U, the U watches in general are gorgeous. Uh, the UX, the U50, the U1, I, I find them to be some of the most fascinating. I mean, this is what I love about it the most is that it's so German. It's just, if you, if you wanted to speak German brutal styling, this is just the way. Uh, it's just clear 1980s in the purest form where we... You know, the 70s, we transition away from the the plots in such an arrangement. And now the 80s is much more, again, brutalist, streamlined in a way. Um, I think it's stunning. As this, it is definitely a masculine watch for sure, it's hardcore. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I think uh, they've managed to arrange all the elements very well. The color schemes are there. This is another watch. Great example, by the way. Who mentioned this? I need to get back to actual, uh, this was from 73 Math. As a watch that brings you back for more, that calls you back, these pieces to me definitely do just that. Because, I mean, I get I get so en entranced by the dial at first, just the, the pure symmetry between the points. Then I look at the red of the strap and how it matches the, the red accents and highlights. Then it's the offsetting of the crown and it's the finishing on the crown and on the bezel itself. Um, there are lots of elements that make this piece just a superb, diving instrument, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, Megan's saying, the new watches look amazing. And I mean, there's so many. Let's have a look at a U1. I think, I think U5, the UX is also a watch that I've enjoyed talking about before. That was a fun video to put together. I'd love to do it again. Just the, just the easy M's and the U lines in the Zen family are just, they really catch your attention and keep you there. And the one understanding that they all unanimously have is understanding of contrast, line weight, the use of color, and just how they can put that into making it into such a legible watch. When you look at it at a glance, you can tell the time in a second, and it's it's incredible. And there was mention about field uh, pilot watches. First, I want to just address the Chopard for a second. Larco GMT from Chip Gage. Let's have a look at that as well. Let's pull up. Now, speaking of which, um, what, is, what is the watch? I've been, there's, wow. Never seen this piece before. This looks pretty new. That is fascinating. So it has a compressor style case. So we have a bezel that rotates with the top crown and the base crown works the, the date, the uh, GMT hand. Really like the finish. I think what pulls me away from it is the, the arrangement of the numerals on the dial. They, they should be white, like the hour hands and the hour and the minute hand. Um, Yima French Air Force is another great example. There's just so many. I mean, we could we could spend months and months <laughs> chatting about these pieces. Um, so 
uh, there was mention about the Larco GMT. I've been asked to actually review a vintage Flieger by our man Eddie. He has a he has a vintage Flieger from 1942 in his collection. I read his email today. I wonder if I should review it, have it in, and discuss a, a watch that was liberated from Africa. Funnily enough, uh, African campaign. Yeah, it's just amazing. Okay, let's look at the show part Alpine Eagle. There's been lots of talk about this watch, and it's, I think the <clears throat> the initial what do we say? This watch was just released at such a poor time. We can talk about that now. Um, there's some mention about the watch looking great and everything else. Um, Triforce saying Grape Dial OP. Oyster Perpetuals in general are just gorgeous watches. Have I even addressed the Oris Aquas? Not really. Um, ah, I want to chat about the Alpine. So this watch was released in tandem with the, um, what is that name? The BR01 or 5, the Ballon Ross model. I saw that piece in a showroom. It's not very pretty. <laughs> um, but this piece being released next to it alongside the, uh, the Lunga Odysseus in a similar time as well. It's This watch now looks a little bit more acceptable when you see it by itself. Mention about a Patek from DK. Ooh, this should be fun. Okay, this is how I'm going to close up the show, actually. I want to... We aren't going to chat about the Acris. I've discussed it before quite often. Let's look up these two Patek references, and then we can kind of call it a, a day. Oof, my goodness. My goodness. These are beautiful. Okay. So this is the one reference, and then another, Larco GMT, I'll pull across. And what's the other reference? I've always, I always enjoy a bit of I320 we've looked at already. No? No, man, not telephones. Let's get in. Interesting. So, so why is it that we've actually spoken about these two watches, this watch already on the show? And this is coming from DK asking the question. Um, I love the questions like, help, I'm trying to decide on X, Y, Z. Kind of kind of brings you into action. Um, oh, so Tom Austin's saying, I'm on the verge of buying the great white Seamaster Professional. Okay. I definitely want to pull that watch up. So let's just leave it at there. I don't want to go too much deeper into this because we will just be spending... Uh, hours again on this uh, white. Will they give me a good example? Yes, they will. Okay, so where to begin? Ah, let's see, Chopard Alpine Eagle. There was talk about this watch and two-tone. It looks stunning, by the way. It really looks stunning. And this piece, as, um, as Megan says, everyone forgets its history for sure. I mean, this watch was inspired very directly by an original vintage piece. Here it is. And in the same way, I think, you know, they have addressed it very well, paying paying tribute to the old model. I just wish, because the, the sad thing is, when I see this, I think it's it's trying to, uh, in a way, it must have come out in that same time period as the, the Royal Oak and the Nautilus and all those pieces. We see the setting of the screws and the bezel. Oof, the screws don't line up. That's, that's going to get people angry. Um, the bracelet and everything else integrated very much of its time. This piece, on the other hand, uh, it's, it has grown on me a little bit. I think the one aspect that I, that I don't like that kind of draws me away, here's a good example. I don't really like the screws on the bezel. I don't know about all of you, but the screws to me are just a bit too jarring. Um, it would be so much nicer with a cleaner aesthetic. Again, sorry if I'm flicking through images. I'm trying to find something that manages to fill the screen so you can all see it okay. If the screws were eliminated, it would look much more streamlined, a lot more basic. But then again, it would lose, it would be too simple then, and it's yeah, it's difficult. It's one of these watches that I can sit and just like try and talk through for hours, but never come to a, a solid conclusion. Like the Lunga Odysseus, you know, as Robert says, ugh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the way it is. Okay, I'm going to slowly close off these tabs because we're you know we're dragging these on as always. So the question that was asked about these two models. 5320 or the 5327. I mean, it's a no-brainer for me. Get the 5327. It is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I love just the Breguet numerals, the finishing, I looking at the dials. It's a masterpiece. It really is. And when I think about a watch representing a brand better, this one does it. And there's there's different variants. There's some with batons and everything else, but I think the Breguet numerals are Stunning, sublime. This watch to me represents the Patek line a lot more than a watch that looks to be more inspired by, you know, 
it feels almost like a pilot's watch from the from the 40s um classy elegant as said i don't think there's much comparison this this really does sing and i also just love how everything's integrated you you return to it and you see that the dial and everything fits inside the dial so neatly uh, the numbers haven't been cut off anywhere what's another again battling with these these images i'm going to have to use a different browser next time because it really is annoying love the fact that the numerals come on there's a goodie that the numerals aren't cut off apart from the six everything is nicely spaced and centered it's clean symmetrical it's a real like it's a hardcore workhorse without question as megan says i mean it's beautiful so dk if you're still in the chat I, I would take this but again mentioned by by robert saying too busy that's that's another thing i mean if that's your dilemma uh, it is definitely i mean what it's it's an annual calendar i wouldn't say it's perpetual but it is it probably is perpetual though i don't know i can never tell but the uh the arrangement is it's quite cluttered but at the same time as an everyday wearing piece yeah it's, it's a beautiful watch really is stunning summer summarizes what the brand represents and what it's about and then getting to this white seamaster professional i think this is a, a lot of fun so what is it about this watch that i mean i was debating picking up one of these hodinkee sells them now that's good to know i didn't know hodinkee was an omega boutique now too it's pretty incredible and all of you who are joining i'm sure most of you are leaving now thank you all so much for being a part of the show and collaborating and contributing um again again if you've just joined the beginning of the show the first 20 or so minutes we get into the psychology of of collecting watches and what you enjoy so much um gary murray great having you here gary um new to the hobby incredible content that is amazing well welcome highly recommend you look at the beginning of the video uh, it might leave you with more questions and answers but <laughs> uh, i recommend you look at the first 20 minutes because that's when we really dig into the bedrock i have a crib sheet of notes we, i guess we could pull up uh, just discussing about you as a person what to look for in a watch characteristics and all of that stuff i'll just leave it on the screen actually when we talk about this piece okay so i'm a sucker for a sports diver for sure i mean that's it uh, and gary another thing you must be careful as carla says this hobby is a rabbit hole i mean that that sums it up perfectly um you have to really and uh, what's amazing about youtube this platform as a resource is it's so valuable for all of us and people tend to squander that fact many just use it as a place to sell stuff and not necessarily share insights or thoughts too much about the watches that they like or um extra details about the pieces that are important or as something that you as a buyer should consider when picking up a watch you know uh, there's there's lots of things so talking about the great white this is a watch that came out like a year ago i was one of the first to jump on it so it got really popular on this page actually i dubbed it the great white seamaster and it really was a watch that i believed was vying for a position next to the uh, the panda daytona the uh, the explorer 2 all of those white dial variants and they they really nailed it even though they have done white dial seamaster variants before but talking about this piece I was so close. I was on the fence. It was kind of like it was either between this or the Seamaster that I picked up, the uh, the 300 reissue. <sighs> Should I pull it up? Let's, let's, yeah, as, as we cap off the show, let's pull up these these last two, compare them side by side. Seamaster 1957. If anyone wants to know, I still love it. I wear it on the weekends now. I mainly wear it on the weekends because it's just, oh, it's something I look forward to wearing, you know? You know what I mean? That is my actual watch being advertised would you believe it's pretty amazing that is where i got it from swiss swiss watch trader so oh my gosh this zoom function i don't know how well you can see this but that should be okay is this better that's much better so talking about these two watches side by side what can we say um the reason this it was literally a 50 50 split between these two pieces between this and and the, the 57 for me what really won me at the end was the history behind this i love the fact that it's not only a functional diver that can be used every day but at the same time it's it's just so aesthetically gorgeous the balance on the dial you can see i have a bit of a sickness when it comes to numerals and batons on dials that's just that's just the way it works with me i've i've found a niche area that i that i enjoy which is the blend of nu numerals and batons things like 
the minute track being overexpressed, so it's much easier to to tell the time. You can literally tell the time to the minute at a glance. What is that? Uh, Thirteen minutes past ten, just in in a flash. You can tell it so quickly, um, and it's the same. The reading experience is just so good. Robert saying that on the yes four three that was about the price I paid for sure. That was pretty much the number I paid. Um, and these are much cheaper, actually, which is funny. I mean, you're getting a, a watch with a date complication. You're getting something with a ceramic bezel, ceramic dial, uh, a, a dive extension that's, that's much more practical. It has an extension that you can put over your wetsuit and everything else. Um, it's very versatile, for sure. The color scheme is also gorgeous because you have, you have white and black. We spoke about panda dials in the beginning of the show. Um, but then it's, it's the polarizing aspects that took me away from it. And it's that sort of thing. I guess it's this. I could use this as a practical example at the end of the stream, basically saying, and you guys are chatting away. Um, Megan saying, "Need to get your body clock." Yeah, I mean, Thomas. Thomas is a candidate here who needs to take a serious amount of sleeping pills <laughs> to get himself back in sync. So, really, I was sitting with both of these watches on the screen. They were both up for sale, and. It took me so it took me like two weeks at least to come up with a conclusion. What about this watch is polarizing? The faux patina, the, the high polish for sure. Uh, what's polarizing about this piece? Skeleton sword hands, the uh, helium valve, the bracelets. I think the bracelet's a bit too heavy duty. The size was something that also divided my opinion. I didn't 42 mils is too big for me generally, even though I think it's a beautiful looking watch. I think it's very versatile and dress oriented. It, it would look just too big on my wrist. And I've seen uh, one of the best things to do is to actually look at this watch everywhere. Scour, you, scour YouTube, scour the internet. Go onto Reddit, for example, and look at what the watch looks like on wrists before trying it on yourself, obviously, and see just where your wrist might fit into that area as well. And all of these eliminating factors that I just, I just didn't enjoy too much. Uh, when it comes to the dial arrangement in itself, the batons and the plots, I just find it to be something a bit mm, too hardcore, a little bit too heavy duty, if you know what I mean. Uh, there's, there's so many aspects. Again, if it, if it comes down to talking through everything else, we'll be here for another hour. But, but really, the thing that, that sold this watch to me in the end was it's, it's an original. You know, it's based on the first dive watch that Omega ever made. It's so clean and simple. You notice just the sheer contrast between the two. Basic looks pretty under the radar next to something a lot more hardcore. You can see why they call this the professional. You know, it's, it's, built, it's built to be a professional watch. Um, and things like, you know, 1957, my dad was born then, that exact year. So I thought, you know, it's another cool thing, ties it in. Um, size and scale, the watch fits neatly on, on an average size wrist, which is something else. And it's just on and on and on. That's the whole thing. I mean, it really does clarify the show. Uh, when it comes to choosing a watch, me as a good example. This should have been the beginning of the show, you know what I mean? Um, you need to think about all of those aspects before pulling the trigger to save yourself the effort. I mean, it's, it's a lot of effort, but in the long run, I think you'll appreciate it when it comes to like rationalizing all these points. And of course, you need an emotional connection to it too. I mean, I love the fact that it has James Bond tied up with it. Um, it's a great combination. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's a really nice Nice looking piece that could be used on all sorts. I mean, I love it on the rubber strap as well. But that's it. I mean, that's that's the way it is. <laughs> Cherry Pepper saying we're still on. Yeah, we are. We're about to we're about to call it though, I think. But overall, talking about Oris Blue Dial, it's another great example. Um, or <laughs> that's bridge catalog overview. James, you know me too well. I love you guys who've been a part of the show for so long, like over a year. And you know all the quirks. We used to check out uh, watches of Knightsbridge catalogs. And I think we'll do it again because they're just some amazing stuff we can browse through at once. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's been it. I hope you've managed to take something away from this. I don't know how much. But the real thinking was when it comes to picking up your next watch, it's rationalizing everything that you do. Um, and asking, so what's the next watch? Referring to me. I'm pretty well set at the moment, having fun with my field watches, my pilot watches, divers. Um, for dive watches, I, I'm all set. This, this thing just does it all for me. It's, it's neutral, basic to be worn every day, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, as far as I haven't even thought that far, actually, you know, that's, that's the way it is. 
but yeah, you guys have been great. And Thomas, thank you for the super chat always, man. Uh, Tom Austin saying that 42 millimeters is your limit too. Yeah. But on the other, but other factors, I love the CMOS professional still makes it worthwhile. And that's it. I mean, the watch needs to speak to you. And if it does, if it has something that really calls to you, there's so many things to appreciate about it. They really nailed the, the redesign of this watch in the, the next generation. And speaking of which, I have a strong belief that Omega is going to be bringing out a midsize. Don't pick up this watch yet because they might be bringing out a midsize variant of this. I made a video about it too. Um, 38 and a half millimeters for this watch would be an absolute smash hit because you get, you get such a gorgeous presence of the bracelet on the wrist, case size and everything in between. They would make a killing. That's all I'm saying. I need to speak to Amiga's CEO one day, you know. <laughs> uh, you guys are great. And look forward to next week because we are going to be chatting about date just on Tuesday and then Thursday talking about uh, ultra dive watches, the two real prototype divers that set the standard over time. The, the, the Challenger Ultra Deep that was worn by um, James Cameron, the Challenger that was worn by James Cameron or used in his, uh, his descent, and then the Omega Ultra Deep and just comparing and contrasting their designs and all of those details. And so it goes. I just want to say hi to Thomas sent another super chat. Thomas, you're such a legend. I wish I could like, I want to send you sleeping pills or something because it feels like you just never do sleep. <laughs> uh, thanks for another great stream. Yeah, great to see everyone. It's always such a pleasure having you here. I mean, that's the main thing. The idea behind the subject that we can all just engage and chat about how we would approach you know, choosing watches and what we would do. It's always a lot of fun. And uh, Megan, absolute pleasure. 73 Math and G, all the rest of you. It's an absolute pleasure. And Chip saying, you can't get off that easily. You're coming down the rabbit hole, the rest of us. Then we're talking about Gary, who's just joined. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think what makes this platform so great is that we can all share our insights. And you know, you, you, many of you have much more experience in this area than I do. So it just adds that extra, if you want, at the end of the show, I don't know if you can, but comment on this video about something that you would possibly do for anyone who is new to the hobby and, and so it goes. I mean, that's just it's the way we try and push our knowledge or our understanding of things around and, and share insights and so on and so forth. So as always, everyone, you have been great. For all of you who are commenting, Carlos, Orange Hand, Ricardo, uh, Junior Johnson, all of you who've been a part of the show and, and you know helping out creating some kind of dialogue and everything else. It's great. Um, look forward to next week. I hope you have a superb Sunday. <laughs> Tetley, you did miss it by a little while. Um, have a superb Sunday. Enjoy, enjoy the last day of the weekend and have a good start to next week. Enjoy what's coming out. I think it should be a nice change of pace. I'll be working on write-ups on more Smith's pieces, which should be fun. And that's the way it is. Uh, it's always a, it's always a working day, but, um, Talk about the watch you've owned the longest, Robert. That should be the subject for the week's show, not next week's, but the week after. Again, those of you who are watching the show at the moment, send in your wrist shots to my email. Uh, wrist shot week is happening next weekend. And uh, yeah, that is all she wrote, as Megan says, sleep time. <laughs> Great to have you all here as always. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and catch up with you next week with date justs and dive watches. So look forward to that. See you soon and cheers for now.